chairs, Scott and Cameron and Rod Mather, um, who it turns out actually have limbs. So <laughs> have what? you have limbs. Oh, we have not just heads. Yeah. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. And welcome to the Committee on Offshore Science and Assessment. And thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us. It's great to be meeting in person while also welcoming some committee members and outside experts who can be joining us via Zoom. This is a special COSA meeting since it coincides with the 50th anniversary of BOEM's Environmental Studies Program, which has championed um, use-inspired science to manage development of the nation's offshore energy resources in an environmentally and economically responsible way, and in doing so has made a vital contribution to our understanding of the OCS. Thank you to the National Academies and the leadership of BOEM for all their hard work in organizing this meeting. A huge thank you to the folks um, uh, from BOEM who have submitted the profiles that we're going to discuss and the other staff and subject matter experts who have contributed with their ideas and review. We know you're all very, very busy. Thank you to the regional and programmatic leaders who are going to provide us with overviews um, of their units and of course to the outside experts joining us today and tomorrow for giving your time, knowledge and wisdom. We're delighted to say that we have a large number of experts joining us over the next two days. And speaking of volunteering, thank you to our fellow COSA members for all your hard work and your time and your wise counsel. We are confident that this meeting will be interesting and productive. Over the next two days, we are going to review and discuss 10 study profiles, six today and four tomorrow. We'll hear from all regions and all programs. Today, the study profiles are broadly connected to renewable energy, particularly offshore wind. And we'll hear from headquarters, the Atlantic, the Office of Renewable Energy Programs and the Pacific region. And then tomorrow, we will um, hear from the Minerals Management program and from the Gulf of Mexico and from Alaska. <clears throat> There's a good mix of disciplines represented, including a solid contribution from the social sciences, something that we've been discussing in COSA over the past year. Some themes for our two days are offshore wind and whales and new or enhanced responsibilities for BOEM, including carbon sequestration and renewables. And these new responsibilities mean perhaps we have more baseline studies than may have been typical in the past. The 10 studies that we are going to discuss are a subset of a larger studies development plan, which includes 45 study ideas and profiles. And of those, a smaller number will ultimately move forward to the national studies list for funding. This COSA meeting fits into the workflow of review and discussion of the SDP, and those profiles. And so thank you all once again. And um, I think we look forward to two productive uh, days of dialogue and discussion. Standing overview, Rod. Um, and I want to echo uh, Rod's comments in welcoming everybody here today, both our, our uh, uh, Boom, friends, we haven't seen you for a while. It's been since uh, early 2000, uh, uh, 2020 when we met in Alaska, and it's great to see some familiar faces back again at the table. Um, we, we've missed the face-to-face -face interaction, and we're really looking forward to that here today. And, and plus, we have our, you get to meet our, our new COSA members who've joined us since that time, uh, who are most of the folks at the table. Um, this is... Uh, an important meeting for us to get together on. I think this is the eighth uh, session we've had uh, that I've been involved in when we talk about the study development profiles. I, I came on uh, when COSA started as an observer for Beezer uh, back in 2015. And uh, I think we've gone through this, this is now the eighth time, go around, we're gonna look at these profiles. So uh, it is an important opportunity for feedback from COSA. Um, COSA is charged to give you ad, ad, advice and assistance uh, to uh, help uh, you manage uh, the uh, environmentally and economically uh, responsible development of our nation's energy resources. And your mission has gotten, if anything, much more complicated than when we started back in 2015. You now have not only oil and gas and, and the marine minerals program focused on 
on uh, managing coastal uh, uh, restoration, but you're being asked to go in dramatic growth in renewable energy, particularly wind, but also looking at other forms of renewable energy, uh, asked to uh, help address carbon capture and storage in the offshore. We're looking forward to hearing more about that. Hope we'll hear what, what your plans are here before too long. Uh, and, and other challenges as well. And uh, you know, I can't think of a, a, a more uh, important uh, uh, time frame for you guys to get after this stuff, uh, given all the challenges our nation is facing right now, both in terms of energy security, but also in terms of uh, addressing uh, a whole myriad of, of challenges we face on the, on the science front. So welcome, uh, and a particular shout out to the, uh, our, our guests who are coming in. We really appreciate those who volunteered to help us uh, in, in, in providing feedback to you all today. Um, one request, or two requests. I know that uh, in each of the regions, you're going to uh, try to give us a little overview of why we're seeing the particular proposals, the subset of proposals we're, we're, we're getting from your groups. Uh, that is of interest to us. Uh, and, and also uh, for the presenters, uh, in order to make, I know you've got a lot of stuff to show. Uh, uh, we hope that you can uh, uh, limit your, your uh, presentations to uh, uh, time periods somewhere in the seven to 10 minute range. I think it's been cited so that we uh, have ample time to uh, provide the, the uh, feedback on the questions, many questions which you've already raised to, to COSA. So again, thank you all. I'm looking forward to a uh, an energetic two days. Thank you, Rod and Scott. Um, I'll just take another moment. Uh, I did cover some of our in-the-room logistics, um, but also uh, just housekeeping items for those that are on the line. Um, both in the room and online, uh, our preference will be to use the raise hand feature in Zoom. If you are not at your computer to raise your hand, um, but you are in the room, please just uh, feel free to raise your hand physically. I will make note. Um, but for those that are on their Zoom, uh, I will be checking for the raise hand feature uh, for the uh, purposes of our discussion. I also uh, want to echo the thanks. We, we do have quite a large crowd online. So we will not do um, full introductions for everybody that's joining us today. But I would like to do a quick round of introductions for those um, in the room. So um, we'll start maybe with Rodney and go around. And then the last thing I just want to say before we get that underway is if you are online, please um, do remain muted if not called upon to speak. Um, we'll be trying to monitor that as well. But to the extent that you can assist with that, that will um, prevent interruptions. So uh, we'll go start with Rodney and maybe go around the table and then we'll um, start back and go around the room as well. Very good. Thanks. Uh, I'm Rodney Cluck. I'm chief of Bohm's Division of Environmental Sciences and the Environmental Studies Program. Hi, everyone. Uh, Jennifer Ewald with uh, um, the Environmental Studies Program. I work with uh, Rodney and the rest of the folks here. Uh, I am currently serving as the Science Communication Outreach Liaison. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kevin Stokesbury. I'm the Dean of uh, the School for Marine Science and Technology at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Uh, and I work on uh, uh, fisheries oceanography and environmental interactions, and I'm a COSA member. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jack Barth. I'm a professor of oceanography at Oregon State University. And I work on a wide range of coastal physical oceanographic uh, projects, and I'm a coastal member. Hi, everyone. My name is Emily Young. I'm a Canals Marine Policy Fellow working with Dr. Yoko Furukara in um, OEP at Boehm. My background is in deep sea biology, and this year I'm thinking about climate change at Boehm. I'm Katrin Eichen. I'm a professor in marine biology at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and I work mostly in Arctic and other Alaskan waters, and I'm a new COSA member. Hi there. I'm Jen Bosick. I am in OEP's Division of Environmental Assessment. I'm a branch chief, and I'm here to sort of speak on behalf of the assessment folks. Hi, I'm Jonathan Tucker. I'm a National Academy staff. Uh, Scott Cameron, I'm a geologist. I was with Shell for uh, 32 years, uh, mostly in uh, exploration and production. 
have consulted since then and uh, volunteered for the National Academies uh, in various roles since 2015. Hi, I'm Rod Mather. I am um, an underwater archaeologist and applied historian at the University of Rhode Island, and I am co-chair of COSA. Hi, I'm Stacey Karras. I'm a National Academies staff with the Ocean Studies Board, and I'm the study director for the COSA committee. Good morning. I'm Jessica Bravo. I am uh, BOEM's Deputy Chief Environmental Officer, and I also manage the contract with the National Academies. Yoko Furukawa. Um, I work for BOEM OEP, hey. Office of um, Environmental Programs, and uh, the Branch Chief for the Physical and Chemical Sciences, working for Rodney. Good morning. Carrie Pomeroy, uh, Research Social Scientist. Uh, Institute of Marine Sciences at UC Santa Cruz, and my background's in sociology, anthropology, and marine policy, and most of my work focuses on human dimensions of fisheries and uh, marine space use coordination. Nice to, oh, and I'm a COSA member. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh, good morning. I'm Jeremy Firestone. I'm a COSA member. I'm a professor at the University of Delaware School of Marine Science and Policy and do a lot of work on renewable energy and climate and with a special expertise related to offshore wind. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Lori Suma. I'm a new COSA member and a geologist retired from uh, ExxonMobil, uh, mostly in research and exploration and currently adjunct at uh, Rice and UT Austin. Hi, good morning, Rona Cox, also a new COSA member. I'm a, a ge geologist. I'm at Williams College in the Geosciences Department and um, my expertise is in coastal geomorphology, coastal erosion, and I also work with tribal communities in Louisiana, um, with the impacts of climate change and land loss. Good so morning. Uh, my name is Shane Guam. I'm an oceanographer uh, within Booms. I'm on the studies program. I work for uh, Yoko um, Furukawa. I'm in the branch of physical and chemical sciences. Uh, my background is ocean acoustics and uh, acoustic, uh, marine bioacoustics. Thanks, Shane. Uh, hi, everybody. Sorry to displace Shane for a minute. Uh, I'm Jake Levinson. Uh, I'm a marine biologist uh, in the headquarters and Division of Environmental Studies, so in Rodney's group. Uh, I work mainly on uh, marine mammals and uh, protected species like sea turtles and, and some fisheries work as well. Can I just grab my coffee real quick and then make it? I'm John Lee of the Boom. I'm a community policy program. Hi, good morning. I'm Eric Taylor. I'm from Gold now in Alaska Region of the Studies Program. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah McPherson. I am a public affairs officer for the Environmental Programs and also the Bureau of Speech. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bob Lewis. I work for ETEC Inc. Uh, we do radar for the movement of things, birds, bats, <laughs> airplanes. Drones is a big new landscape for us, um, but I've got a lot of interest in everything that's going to be going on here. I'm a fan of uh, Mr. Matt Matter's work. I'm just looking forward to learning. Uh, good morning. I'm Laura Kerger. I'm with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. I'm a by trade and I'm with the program. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Eric Uh Good morning. Jeff Reidenauer. I'm the uh, Chief of the Marine Minerals Division in Bohm's headquarters office. Thanks, Jeff. I think with that, um, we've got everybody that's in the room. Um, I'd just like to give the opportunity for three other folks that are on the line to introduce themselves. They are the remaining COSA members that I know are on. Um, we've got Susan Parks, Mary Louise Timmermans, and Les Kaufman, if you'd like to um, go, Susan, I, I'm looking at you first. So we'll, we'll go to you and then Mary Louise and then Les. Great, thanks. I'm Susan Parks. I'm a professor of biology at Syracuse University. Um, my research focuses on um, marine mammal acoustic communication and the effects of noise. Hi everyone, I'm Mary Louise Timmermans. I'm a professor at Yale University and a physical oceanographer. My research focuses on the Arctic Ocean. Nice to see you all. And Les, are you on the line? 
Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, Les Kaufman, professor in the marine program at Boston University. And I'm a marine benthic ecologist. And my current research uh, focuses on climate change and the interaction between coastal society and the uh, continental shelf marine ecosystem. Thank you, Les. We're running just a, a few minutes behind getting started, but we'll adjust accordingly. Um, and I appreciate everybody bearing with us. I think it's important that we that we do the introductions. Um, so with that, um, I'll skip a review of the agenda. I think we can just jump right into it. Uh, the first remarks that we're going to hear are from Rodney, and they're regarding uh, the Environmental Studies Program um, and updates to the 2024-2025 SDP. Great. Thank you, Stacey. Um, assuming, yeah, there we go. The presentation is coming up. So yeah, uh, you know, thanks to the co-chairs. Thanks to the, the Coastal Committee. It is really nice to be here in person after so long. It really feels feels good to have uh, have an in-person meeting where we can you know discuss and engage. And I you know really appreciate uh, everything from the, from the academies and the COSA. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, I wanted to uh, just give you some updates on the studies development plan and kind of where we are with things, and just some updates on the environmental studies program in general, and and re remind folks. And I know there are some new members as well. So um, the, the environmental studies program is, is, is BOEM's environmental science program. So it's one program that serves all of our offices in all of our regions, no matter if that's renewable energy, oil and gas, marine minerals, uh, carbon sequestration, um, now green hydrogen, uh, other things that are coming our way. Uh, so it's pretty much across the board. Um, we are authorized in the OCS Lands Act. That's how um, we're older than Bohm. Uh, Bohm is a little over 10. We're 50. So, you know, we have been around for quite a while uh, and have produced a, an amazing amount of science in that, in that time. And I might add, and scientists. We spent over $1.25 billion on science. Um, our funding is around $30 million a year, up a little bit this year, which I'll talk about later for, for IRA funds. Um, we do go through a rigorous planning process, a study development plan, which you've all, all seen. And then we uh, contract out our studies through interagency agreements, cooperative agreements, or contracts as, as we're going down this road to, you know, for folks to produce the science. So our, we're more of the managers. Next. The pillars of the environmental studies program are, are very important to us. Um, we realize that our program is applied and we do science to inform decisions. We call it use inspired because anytime somebody comes up with a study idea, I mean, the first question I ask are, okay, how are we going to use it? Because we have a lot of ideas and, and not enough money to fund everything. So we have to really hone in. That doesn't mean that we don't have the utmost levels of integrity and credibility in that science. Um, we're a very small program. We're a couple of hundred scientists in BOEM. BOEM is only around 600 people. Uh, so it's very important for us to, to partner with other federal agencies, the private sector, and academics to do the science. So partnering and leveraging is really a pillar of our success. And we make all of our science, uh, we put it all out there on, on the web and uh, to try to really educate folks on the science that we're producing and how we use it. Next. So as I was saying, we have a couple hundred scientists, so we maintain this core expertise. Uh, you know, within BOEM, you know, on, on these numerous scientific disciplines, uh, the BOEM scientists develop, oversee, and manage the research projects in partnership with, again, other federal agencies or academics or the, or the private sector, uh, really across the entire community. So while we totally encourage our scientists to get out on ships and do field work and, and, and work in that sense, they are really the science managers and, and oversee the portfolio. Next. Uh, partnerships are essential. Uh, I think you got to hit it again for all the logos to come up. Um, again, a, a program that's as small as ours really does depend on uh, on other agencies. We don't we don't have the assets of ships. We don't have satellites. We don't have uh, you know ROVs, but we, we know where to find them, and we work with other partners to make this happen. So this is really a, an important part of our program. Next. So criteria for study development and approval. 
um, we focus on what we need to know. Um, and sometimes that's easier said than done, but what do we need to know to make good decisions on energy and mineral development on the outer continental shelf? We, while we have an applied program, we also want to ensure we're contributing to the existing state of knowledge and really enhancing that. And I think over the last 50 years, we've definitely done that. Uh, we maintain a high robust level of methodology. Uh, the studies need to be cost effective. Again, leveraging and partnering are really essential. You know, we have about 2.5 billion acres now. That's including the territories that we have and the five territories. So that's quite a bit of land area of the water. So, uh, you know, we, we, we really need to partner as much as possible. And anytime we can do a study with multi-regional um, strategic utility, uh, for example, if there is an avian biology study in the Atlantic that the methods uh, can be applied in the Pacific, that's a good thing. And we're trying to get that, you know, we're just trying to be able to use the science for multi-regions. Not that every, every study is going to be like that, but, but some may. And we, we want to, you know, encourage that kind of learning. Next. Um, so each year we go through this process and, you know, um, I've been chief over a decade now and, and, and the crazy thing about it is it never ends. We just keep doing it over and over again. Scott, I think you said eight years we've been doing this, but it, maybe before, you know, that with the, our own FACA committee, we continue to do it. Now, the adjustments happen, but each year we request uh, input from our scientists and stakeholders. What do we need to study? We have a distribution list with thousands of people that provide input uh, to us. We take all that input, our scientists put it together into our, studies, uh, our study profile development, which you all sit, received our study development plan. We go through an internal review because we want to leverage and use our own scientists, um, not so much to critique each other, but to really create that culture of collegiality where they can add, you know, input. If you're studying a certain topic on whales, you can have perspectives from all the marine mammal experts across Guam. So we try to get it as right as we can at first. Uh, then we release the SDP, uh, first send it to you all, and then we make it public. Uh, and then this meeting, National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, COSA, review. Uh, we... Uh, after this meeting, we take your input and go back and uh, our regions and offices will re-rank things. Uh, after they send the re-rankings, re uh, it comes back to, to us, to me, and I'll uh, take it to our director. Our director decides what we're gonna fund. So and ultimately our national studies list are based on her decisions. Um, but again, we rank and prioritize. We don't just put 50 things out there and say, go for it. You know, We really you know, think about it a lot first. And then we begin our procurement process and it, the cycle starts all over again. There's gonna be a couple of changes in the future that I, it's not on this graph. Um, we're talking about now how to better engage tribes in the process. Um, they're in the process at the uh, request for stakeholder input. Again, they're on my stakeholder list, but we want to engage them more. So we're thinking about adding a step in uh, during a study profile development, the January, February, March, perhaps timeframe. And then uh, thinking about, you know, towards the end of the process, after the director has made a decision, I'd be bringing that back to them to, to, to engage tribes again on what we decided to study and how it may affect them. Uh, we're also touring with the idea of maybe just doing a series of webinars over, uh, over time on studies that are uh, completed. Um, we put out our quarterly reports, uh, which is great. Um, but I think a series of webinars would be uh, really another good, good thing for us to do. So we're thinking about not only getting that input up front during the process, but also two or three or four years later when the study finishes to present. And I know the community has interest in that as well. Next. Um, so again, the state development plan, what does it do? It's our annual strategic planning document uh, that outlines ESP's uh, direction identifies the information needs, prioritizes the research over a couple of fiscal years with the, the uh, priority being on the, the, the next fiscal year, but we're looking at a couple of years. Um, it's a really an important communication tool, uh, not only for this meeting, but with stakeholders that lets people and for other federal agencies for that matter know what we're gonna do. So we can use it as a science communication tool. Um, and then it serves as, as a foundation for the na national studies list. Again, we draw from the plan. I think, I think we've got 45 of so study ideas in here. We'll draw from the plan and be able to fund 20-ish, depending on 
you know, <laughs> how much they are, 2025. Okay, next. Um, it is based on our decision context, and we write about this in the document. So we do try to look at upcoming decisions in the future. So what kind of information do we need for those decisions that we're going to need to be making on a lease sale or on any kind of study in the next you know, year or two or three or five? And so we, we really try to think about that. Uh, what are these, the current relevant issues we need to consider? What uh, are the topics we need to address? Where are the data gaps? Where's those information gaps we need to fill? So we think about those uh, you know, relevant issues. And then of course, we also think about environmental impact statements um, and, and just NEPA and the various other consultations and compliance that we're um, on the hook for, whether that's National Historic Preservation Act, Clean Air Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Endangered Species Act, you name it, there's a lot of them. Uh, so we, we think about all these things and they really go into our science strategy uh, you know, for each, each region, for each program, and then, and then we have our proposed studies. So that's kind of the, how the, the SDP works in the decision context, which I think is a, an important point. Next, please. Um, not 45, it looks like 53, Scott. In the city state development plan, I think you said 45, but uh, uh, it looks like, yeah, 53, six from Alaska, 10 from the Gulf of Mexico region, six from Marine Minerals Program, Office of Environmental Programs, 18, uh, Renewable Energy Program, 7, and Pacific uh, Office, 6. So that's what we got in the plan. Okay, next. Uh, of those, uh, we, we thought you might have interest in which ones kind of go towards administrative priorities. Uh, climate change, we got six proposed studies dealing with climate change, seven on uh, EJ, Fish and Fishery, six, Tribal Efforts, three. They're not mutually exclusive. Some of the studies, on, and for example, environmental justice and, and tribal may be you know, overlap, right? Because you may, you may incorporate both of those aspects. From our stakeholder and partner input, um, we got 15 proposed studies from the stakeholder input, external stakeholders, eight studies, and federal partners, uh, eight. Again, when we get in these study ideas, you know, we take them. We'll take aspects of these and we'll build it into our own use-inspired science uh, model and kind of what our scientists know we need to know, but there might be aspects or pieces of those that we incorporate. And so the stakeholder input is, is used like that. So just to give you an idea. Next. New and upcoming activities, uh, carbon sequestration, again, the expansion of our work throughout the U.S. territories. Uh, green and blue hydrogen, uh, multi-use activities. I wanted to put this on here because, in, in, you know, we're, we usually, when we issue a lease, it's for uh, a wind facility or maybe for oil and gas or maybe for marine minerals. But we see in the future uh, multi-activities on a particular lease. It could, be, it could be wind and green hydrogen. It could be wind, green hydrogen, and marine minerals. Uh, it could be, you know, uh, other activities that are going on at the same time. Carbon sequestration could be pieces of that so how do we deal with that not only you know as a uh as as, as balm and as the overall program but how do we deal that deal with that scientifically so that's really kind of where we're, we're going on with this with this one and the ocean climate action plan which i think has a lot of interesting work in it um uh, that uh, really does promote and prioritize uh, you know for the entire nation Offshore wind, carbon sequestration, a couple of the, you know, number one and number two in the plan hit directly mm -hmm. home for us. So I think this plan is really mm -hmm. important. I'm, I'm telling all of our folks, use this as another opportunity to partner, to leverage and say, look, it's, we're all supposed to be focusing on this across the federal government. So I think it's a good opportunity for us to, you know, you know to really point to our program. And next uh surf 50 years of coastal and ocean science recently we put together the esp hub which is a new uh, hub that is out there on our website this is mainly for the public to go in and just look at biological sciences chemical sciences physical social sciences and be able to look up uh, you know certain studies th that we've done we've put everything on there again this is not so much for the power user but it's more for community people or people that are just going in looking uh, for the studies that we've done. Uh, the information is also on GovInfo, uh, which is the more powerful system for more of your scientists or, or power user, I would say. 
Next. And that's it. We, I want to emphasize we welcome comments on the entire study development plan and all of our study profiles. I know we're going to be talking about selected ones today. Each of the offices will tell you why they selected them. But uh, in any, any study idea that we have in the, in the plan, you know, you know, we welcome any kind of input. Totally. So thank you. Thank and you. I'm happy to take questions or whatever you want to do. So. Yeah, we are running a little bit behind, but I think it worth maybe um, allowing one or two questions, as particularly if they're quick. And I will be looking for uh, folks using the raise hand feature or raise hands in the room. Go ahead, Scott. I can't help myself here. So, Rodney, thank you very much for a great overview. I was particularly interested in, and I think it was your second or third to last slide where you talked about multi activities, multiple. And that gets to the comment I was making about the, the, the incredible changes that Bohm has uh, program is, is seeing here. You know, in the past, you know, when you were focused mainly on oil and gas and, and uh, marine minerals programs with coastal restoration and so forth, we weren't looking at actually having um, overlapping activities in the same physical geography on the same leases, potentially. Now we're clearly entering an arena where that looks like it's it's going to happen we're going to we're going to have to deal with that um and there are going to be some key research questions focused on you know how do you sort out the costs and benefits and impacts of putting uh, uh say wind projects versus uh carbon sequestration projects versus green hydrogen projects on the same leases i mean that's um so I, I welcome you flagging that, and I look forward to having further dialogue on that. So I'll we'll be looking for opportunities to talk more about that in the, as the session goes along. And again, we welcome advice from the coast on how to deal with it. We haven't done this before, right? So we, it is going to be complicated, and there's going to be multiple science questions that we have to deal with. Uh, again, we have a great group of scientists, as you know, Scott. And you know, so we're going to you know put people's uh, minds, uh, the best minds to it. But but you, know, uh, we certainly welcome working with COSA to help us think through this. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no additional hands for the sake of time, I'll turn it over now to Jennifer. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to take a, a couple of minutes to introduce you to the Office of Environmental Programs. Um, profiles that we'll be presenting today and sort of the, the context in which OEP thinks about developing study profiles. So I think most folks are, are aware that as a headquarters office, we focus on a national perspective on things that are relevant across regions and programs, um, maybe new technologies that, that we choose to study in order to then facilitate the use by, by other regions or programs, uh, things that have a national need when we're thinking about outreach or education, things that kind of span across. Um, the things that we're thinking about in the future are obviously we think about consultation, mitigation, assessment, and studies in a programmatic context. So things that we can help streamline or find efficiencies or do the research that's going to support those efficiencies. Um, we're thinking about obviously offshore wind, as is everyone else. Um, we continue to think about oil and gas, um, especially as it is uh, irretrievably connected to offshore wind for the foreseeable future, um, and carbon sequestration, which we've mentioned um, a little bit. So offshore renewable energy is obviously taking off in the Atlantic, but we're also thinking about it in the Pacific. Actually, we're moving on it in the Pacific and, and then the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, cumulative impacts, we're talking about multiple use, right? So cumulative impacts are becoming more and more important as we expand programs into new, new regions. Um, in particularly thinking about how we're going to fold carbon sequestration into that um, equation. Climate change obviously <laughs> continues to alter habitats and sort of the, the abiotic processes of the ocean. We need to understand that so that, again, we can look at that cumulative perspective of our activities. Um, that goes hand in hand with greenhouse gas and our contributions from an emissions standpoint, as well as um, the more uh, acute air quality impacts that, that our uh, programs may contribute to. So all of these studies that we think about ultimately serve that loop of assessing and consulting and thinking about how these things are affecting um, both physical human resources, biological resources, and typically individual offices and programs are the lead for their National Environmental Policy Act um, documents or their consultations, things like that. Um, 
all, OEP is actually the lead for, we're um, the lead on a programmatic environmental impact statement for the New York bite lease areas, um, as well as we also lead the environmental analysis for the national oil and gas program development. So <clears throat> when you translate that into our 18 studies that we're proposing, and I will try to move through these relatively quickly. So five of those are focused on acoustics, um, mainly driven by our Center for Marine Acoustics that sits in OEP right now. Three of those acoustic studies are related specifically to offshore wind and two to conventional energy. We have six studies that uh, are directly related to or touch on the aspects of long-term monitoring. We have four studies that are focused on social science, and this is, um, we have two of those that you're going to hear about today. Um, of the other two, there's one that is looking to understand what may happen in the context of, of not leasing for oil and gas anymore in the offshore that's going to have um, potentially uh, major impacts, particularly in the Gulf of Mexico. We also have a study that um, is co-proposed with the Bureau of Land Management that looks at subsistence and cultural uses in Alaska, southeastern Alaska, in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, and then in the Gulf of Mexico to try to understand how subsistence use may um, be more consistent or be different depending on where you are and, and what you're thinking about. We have four studies focused on technology, including one on animal telemetry and one on using high resolution satellite imagery to detect uh, whales. We have an air quality study that's going to look at better tracking emissions from vessels and helicopter activity um, associated with conventional energy. And then finally, we have two literature synthesis studies. Um, one of those is focused on uh, gathering information on the impacts of carbon sequestration, and the other is focused on climate change impacts to sensitive species and habitats. So with that, the three that we're going to hear about today are, um, we have one the first two are your are social science studies. The first is on thinking about offshore wind lease stipulations to improve engagement. Um, and Laura will explain a little bit about it, what that means. Uh, the second study, uh, Megan Cornelison will be presenting on evaluating community benefit provisions for offshore renewable energy. Again, thinking about how we can best serve the communities that may be affected. Um, and entirely non-social science related, but still very pertinent to offshore wind is um, looking at how we might use dimethyl sulfide gradients into dynamic management to predict North Atlantic right whale occurrence in the Northeast. Um, and Jake Levinson will be presenting on that one. So unless there are any questions, I'm gonna jump right in. I'll take one or two very <laughs> brief questions if there are any. All right, seeing none, I think we can turn um, then to Laura who I think is joining us virtually, is that right? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can, thank you so much, Laura. Great to have you on the line. Yeah, great to be here. So I, I'm gonna be presenting on assessing the effectiveness of offshore wind lease sales stipulations on improving engagement. And this has really been a team effort. I've worked closely with, with Megan, who will present next, and then our Canals Fellow from last year, Sarah Parkinson. Um, next slide. So in 2022, the New York Bight Offshore Wind Lease Sale had a first of its kind stipulation included in the final sale notice. Um, and it was requiring lessees to conduct early and regular engagement with tribes and ocean users underserved communities and other stakeholders. Collectively, that group is now called tribes and parties. Um, and they're also required to submit a semi-annual progress report to BOEM that includes how they've identified those um, potentially affected by proposed activities, updates on engagement activities, identification of impacts or benefits, how, if at all, a project has been informed or altered by um, hearing from those populations and any future planned engagement activities. Um, the stipulation also requires that lessees coordinate with one another um, when they have a lease in the same area. In this case, it was the New York bite. Um, and that the intent really recognized in the stipulation that, that it, the goal was to reduce engagement burdens on tribes and parties. Um, and 
ever since this was included in the New York flight lease sale. It's also been included in following lease sales, including Carolina, Long Bay, California, and Gulf of Mexico offshore wind sales. Next slide. So the information need we've um, we scoped to is to better understand the effect of the stipulation on the intended goal to make engagement more meaningful and less burdensome. Um, and then through that, understanding that, to better understand any potential improvements to the stipulation or any other policy mechanisms that could be implemented to complement the stipulation and improve the intended goals. Um, and so we're finding this particularly important right now as BOEM ramps up its offshore wind leasing activities um, and refines lease sales stipulations in advance of upcoming lease sales. Next slide. So the objectives of the study are to basically gain an understanding of how lessee engagement activities and reporting that were required in this lease sale stipulation is affecting underserved communities particularly. Um, and determine whether engagement related lease sales stipulations are improving meaningful engagement and reducing the burdens as intended. Um, and then third, to develop recommendations for future lease sales stipulations and improve practices for implementing. Um, next slide. So the methods we've developed um, are two phases. There's gonna be a literature review uh, and then focus groups um, and a survey. And so the first phase would be a literature review and a focus group in one area um, where there is no stipulation for meaning for improved engagement. And that's to gather perceptions of engagement and what the stipulation might be trying to address. And then the second phase of the study would be an annual survey in a second area where the enhanced engagement stipulation is in effect. Um, and we would plan to do that for three years and have quarterly focus groups going together with the survey to get at questions that might help us determine the level of effectiveness um, of the stipulation in enhancing engagement um, and reducing burdens. Next slide. And so some of our main research questions are, what is the effect of the engagement related lease stipulations over time on perceptions of fairness and trust in decisions and projects? Um, what's the effect on inclusiveness, um, the effect on burden of engagement? Uh, and what are the perceptions of potential impacts and opportunities over time? And then, the second big research question, are, are there any improvements BOEM can make on lease sales stipulations or are there any additional policy mechanisms we could implement to complement lease sales stipulations? And then third, are these enhanced engagement requirements in offshore wind stipulations relevant to other BOEM authorized activities um, and how might they be adapted for these specific applications? Next slide. And so I put in a few questions for COSA. Um, if there's any existing research this effort should build off of, um, are there any areas that particularly stand out with, with or without stipulations that would be especially useful to compare to maximize our learnings um, and apply it to future stipulation development? And then are there any suggested revisions in the methods that would better address the research questions? Thank you. Laura, thank you very much for that presentation. And um, I think I'll speak for the whole committee um, and just saying we appreciate um, how concise you were in pr providing that to us. I think it, it covered the bases, but was exactly what we were looking for. So thank you for that. Um, I will now look for uh, raised hands, both in Zoom uh, and in the room, for folks that would like to um, ask any questions or make any comments. Um, and I'll just remind folks that are on the line that we hope our invited guest will um, participate in this uh, process as well by raising your hand and providing any feedback. Uh, I do see we have um, several hands going up already. So I'm going to turn, uh, I think we'll do it, uh, Jeremy, 
Rona, Les, and then David. Uh, uh, good morning and uh, uh, th thank you, uh, Laura, for that presentation and for, for going through and, and developing. I think understanding the stipulations is really, could, could be quite valuable. Community engagement is critical. Um, I, I think this is a really tough thing to, to research because uh, there's a lot of confounding aspects. Um, the states are doing things uh, in the power purchase agreements. And so uh, teasing out what the effect of the stipulations are versus what the states are doing versus learning as well. So, um, and so your control is really critical. Um, I, I'm not sure that, that say one focus group, uh, I don't know, quite know how you're going to pick it. Um, if, I think if you're going to do this study, I would narrow the focus as I was thinking about this this morning and I would focus on, on uh, New York and New Jersey uh, because in those states, then you only have two states. You also have states that have both pre-lease stipulation areas and, and, and then the New York bite ones. And so there you might be able to do a better comparison and get rid of some of that uh, confounding uh, nature. But I think you may see that developers are learning as they go. Uh, and so you may not see much of an effect from the stipulations per se, it may be difficult. I don't think you're going to be able to, uh, that respondents are not gonna be able to tell you what the effect of the stipulations are. Uh, people in communities, they may know what's going on as far as engagement, they may not, uh, but they won't be able to tell you whether it was the effect of the stipulation, whether it was the developer's initiative uh, or whether uh, it was at the behest of a state. So I, I, I don't think you're going to get much there. You're, I think your best bet is really to in-depth interview developers uh, and try to understand what they think the effect uh, has been. At the same time, you have to understand the developers have some individual incentives uh, and you may not get a clear picture uh, because they've got different incentives going on. Um, so I think I, I, I think the literature review is, is important. I don't think you're going to be able to tell you, uh, you're not going to be able to answer questions per se. Uh, I think you need to do a little more uh, sharpening of the pen on uh, the number of focus groups. One to six is a big, a huge range. Uh, the number of persons who's going to be in those focus groups are going to be really uh, key. And my last point really goes to um, the tribal issues. And, and I think you may find that the stipulations are a negative. Um, tribes, uh, tribal nations are very much believe that uh, there should be government to government uh, engagement, uh, not necessarily shelter, you know, push down to the developers. It doesn't mean that developers shouldn't engage. Uh, but what's going to be key for the tribal governments is uh, the government to government. That means BOEM to the tribal governments, not developers. So that that's that's a sort of add-on. Uh, and I, I, but so the tribes may see this as just more of an effort by BOEM to push this down away from Bohm's responsibility to developers. So you may actually see a negative effect too. So could be interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Turn to Rona next. Thanks, Laura. That was a really interesting um, presentation. And um, my, my question is possibly sort of a naive one, uh, but I, was wondering whether you were planning to do your phase one and phase two in series, like sort of, you know, first phase and the second phase, or whether you were thinking about um, doing them to um, uh, at the same time, like so that you could be get, gathering input from different communities under different sets of circumstances, but holding like whatever the zeitgeist is at, at least semi, semi, um, 
constant. Yeah, we're definitely open to feedback on what you think would, would get us closest to, to answering some of those research questions. Mm -hmm. um, I was envisioning it as a, as a sequential thing. So we do the literature review and do some, some focus groups to understand general problems with engagement that we were hoping the stipulations would address. And then later seeing if the stipulations actually did address those things or not. Um, but I could definitely see like at the same time how things are being implemented differently. Can't quite, nothing comes to mind of a particular region that would be in the same, the timing of the lease sales and the stipulations that we could compare at the same time. Um, One possible, I mean, I, not knowing a whole lot about about uh, offshore wind, but Rhode Island would be a place for getting the no stipulations in place and, and wind already up um, sort of view. And then um, another just uh, in, in view of um, Jeremy's comments about the, the tribal impact, I, I think that's probably correct for a lot of tribes, but I think individuals living in tribal communities also um, in my experience, value the direct contact with people who are actually doing the work um, and uh, so that not everything is, is in a top-down uh, way. So I think that BOEM to tribal government is, is very important, but I, I wouldn't negate the importance of um, having the people doing the work on the ground, speaking to the people who are living there. I, I certainly, the people that I know would appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Les and then to David. Hi, Laura. Thanks so much for the presentation. Um, most of my comments were anticipated by Jeremy and Rona, but there's one thing that really dogs me, and, and that's that the communities uh, vary in their preparedness and capacity to engage. And they're right now, particularly the sovereign the tribal nations, they're undergoing an evolution of trying to have people who are available and uh, in the right position to represent tribal interests. I don't even know what the situation is with other environmental justice communities. So that's a huge covariate. So my question is, how do we take into account where we are nationally in cultivating an engagement process? And what can stipulations do to foster that? Thanks. So we'll turn to David and then to Kerry. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to comment on it. I think it's great that you all are thinking about this and about funding projects to, to look at this. I'll try to, to keep my, my comments brief. One is you asked specifically about other studies that might pertain to this. And something to keep in mind is that the Northeast Sea Grant Consortium has funded several projects in the Northeast US around offshore wind, and a couple of them would be relevant to this, this project, and that includes some work that's going on here at URI. Um, one thing that we've been finding that may be somewhat of a confounding problem is that for a lot of people in communities and for in interest groups, um, they don't do a great job distinguishing from project to project, and that may be in part due to the burden that they face. So it may not always be easy to control, as uh, Jeremy was talking about, between specific projects. Um, I think you can try to do some of that. I do think control is really important. You might think about um, controlling for the developer, actually, and thinking about a particular company like a, an Orsted that has multiple projects where you could look at one that was done uh, with stipulations in place and one that was uh, without stipulations in place. Um, one thing that is a, a big concern of mine anytime people talk about engagement or public participation is the need to really define what the goals are and what the criteria are on which you're going to measure effectiveness or enhancing or meaningfulness and what that really means. Um, and that may require more groundwork 
um, up front to try to think about um, what it is that you're really measuring in terms of effectiveness. I think um, some of the complaints that go on sometimes is that we often think about uh, engagement effectiveness from a, a, a really instrumental viewpoint in terms of, you know, did the project get, uh, is the project approved? How long does permitting take? How many, uh, how many lawsuits do we have? But there's lots of different ways of thinking about the effectiveness in terms of sustainability, quality of decisions, um, uh, sort of democratic values. And I think now there's been a lot of attention too in terms of this idea of justice um, and how uh, engagement can, can affect those, those effects as well. Um, I also just wanna reiterate um, some of the things that Jeremy talked about in terms of, of um, methods. Uh, you're really going to have to think hard about who the the sample is and what the population is that you're trying to draw from. And I think Jeremy's right that um, the general public may have difficulty um, understanding the difference in this time between stipulations or not. Um, you may want to think about, you know, communities of practice and key contacts. And that sort of begs the question of what kinds of surveys it is that you're going to do and whether surveying is the right the right method, depending on who's the the right population to be reaching for these questions. Um, so I'll, I know other people have their hands up, so I'll I'll stop there. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, and thank you for joining us, uh, Carrie. I'll turn to you next. Oops, empty. Um, I'm not sure I have a whole lot to add. I really appreciate the comments made. I also appreciate the concept and the presentation. So thanks a lot. Um, sorry, I'm gonna turn on my camera also so you can see me directly. There we go. Um, yeah, I um, I guess I, I really appreciate the comments made. I don't have a whole lot um, to add, I, I guess, um, but I do have a couple of things. One of the things that occurred to me as I was reading this and thinking about the notion of focus groups and surveys, whether or not they're an appropriate tool to use in trying to pursue the, the objectives of this effort, I apologize, but it sort of sounds like an additional burden. Um, and so, especially with a focus group commitment, and yet focused discussions around the topic of engagement in this context could be incredibly helpful and fruitful. Um, I think they'd have to be very carefully designed and very um, uh, bounded in a sense um, with appropriate folks at the table and a very clear understanding of, of sort of the terms of engagement, if you will, but also um, settling on definitions of, of terminology like engagement and community uh, and, and so on and so forth. I think this also brings to mind the diversity of players in this situation, diversity of developers. And there are numerous case studies um, in, in ocean related context and in some other contexts, um, different developers, if you will, um, proceed differently, handle engagement differently, whether they have stipulations or not. Um, and I think there's a great deal to be learned about what folks have done in a variety of contexts, whether they've had these stipulations articulated or not. Um, and so I would encourage you in seeking to understand this, this landscape or seascape, if you will, um, to be very mindful of that. That, of course, adds a great deal of variability in terms of any particular assessment of impact of stipulations themselves. Um, the one other thing, and maybe maybe I, I'm just repeating something that's already considered, but I think of engagement as a learning process, and I think that's been mentioned. And I would I would encourage you to think about. Um, the learning that goes on all the way around the table in these engagement processes and um, think about the relevance of that learning essentially in, in the process and outcome accomplishments of, of engagement. Um, I think in some cases we have a tendency to think of engagement 
as a one way, how do we communicate to people? Yeah, we want to hear them. But at the end of the day, what we really want to do is persuade them, um, which may be fine. Um, but I think there is a great deal to be said for um, this exchange among people, developers and community members variously defined and agency folks and so on um, in learning from one another. And I've actually seen a little bit of this happen with the California Energy Commission in some of the localized discussions about um, offshore renewable energy, ocean wind energy development recently. So anyway, that's um, just a couple of additional comments and thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Carrie. Laura, it looked to me like you were taking notes um, about as furiously as I was. <laughs> so um, I wanna give you an opportunity if you have any questions or responses to any of the folks that have spoken um, or any sort of additional questions that you'd like to, to throw out to the group. I, I don't have anything specific right now. I just thank you all so much for all of your feedback. I'm, I'm gonna, we're gonna obviously think really hard about the focus groups and surveys and whether how to make them most appropriate for the research questions. And so, yeah, if anybody thinks of anything, um, feel free to email me ideas um, as we kind of try and rescope this a bit to make sure we're, we're getting the information we, we're seeking. So thank you. Thank you. Stacy, yeah. I, I have a process question. This is actually an excellent discussion. It's, you know, great job, Laura, in staying in, keeping it concise and cogent. Great questions from our group. We had a lot of feedback given. I'm thinking ahead here. Laura offered to take questions via email, but I'm also looking to our, uh, our, our friends from BOEM. How would you like questions to come in or com additional comments, because we'll probably get other situations during the meeting where there'll be further for, for feedback we can't catch in the meeting. Do you want it to come to you to pass on to the to the authors or how do you want to? I'm looking at Rodney and Jessica here. Hmm, uh, okay, well, well I, I guess let's make it uh, consistent because that will be most efficient. So uh, Dr. John Lilly is sitting behind me. Uh, Comments coming in, I, I think, uh, John, you can coordinate, and, uh, and then we can get those to the right people. So I think uh, if you could do that, send them to Dr. Lilly and, and include me uh, and Jessica. That okay. would be helpful because that way nobody, nothing will slip through the cracks. And some might be at a, at a level that maybe Jessica or I or somebody else needs, needs right. to weigh in and others right. might be more technical. Right. Thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, the National Academy staff is happy yes. to coordinate that as well. Yeah. Um, I'll just add that we we um, do have some invited guests that were not able to join us today who plan to, who either already have or plan to provide written feedback as well. So we'll make sure we get that to you. Um, and with that, thank you so much, Laura. We'll move on to our second profile, uh, which is the Evaluating Community Benefit Provisions for Offshore Renewable Energy. And we'll have uh, Megan presenting. I believe Megan is online as well. I am. Can you hear me? We can. Thanks, Megan. Okay. Um, and are, are you guys projecting slides or shall I? It looks like we have them up for you. Um, okay. So we can go ahead and do it unless you would prefer to. If you're able to, that's perfect. I can, I can say next slide, next slide. <laughs> Perfect. Yep, we've got them. Um, I think that's Laura's presentation. Nope, that's the same one. Same one. Would it be better if I go ahead and share my screen? Oh, I see it down there. Underneath, couple, couple down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me. My name's Megan Cornelison, and I'll be presenting this profile on community benefit provisions for offshore renewable energy. Laura and I worked on this profile together. Um, we are both social scientists in the Division of Environmental Assessment in the Office of Environmental Programs. We can go ahead to the next slide, please. 
um, some background on community benefit provisions as we're considering for this study. As defined by Bristow et al, community benefits are some form of additional positive provisions for the area and people affected by a major development. Uh, these provisions are typically negotiated between developers and local or state entities or are provided voluntarily um, by project developers as part of their corporate social responsibility portfolios. Um, some examples include negotiated agreements such as community benefit agreements or host community agreements. Um, they can also include direct investment, such as investing, for example, in a training program at a local community college. I want to clarify that by benefit provisions, we're referring to, like I said, some form of additional uh, kind of directed positive provisions beyond the quote, beneficial impacts of an action such as employment. Um, as such, they are not typically included in environmental analyses of specific actions. An important note to make here also is that BOEM does not have statutory authority to mandate uh, community benefit provisions or have um, a whole lot of you know, financial implementation or enforcement authority. So these are kind of um, typically um, agreements between, like I said, communities and developers. What we can do, what BOEM can do as the lead federal agency for offshore energy development is provide resources and serve in, in a convening role. Um, so that's kind of the uh, lane we're in for this study. We can jump to the next slide, please. All right, so why does BOEM need information on community benefits? Um, we are hearing a lot about this topic from a number of um, directions where we often hear in public uh, meetings from stakeholders and community uh, members um, that their communities should benefit from specific projects. Um, we've also heard repeatedly from community-based organizations about the importance of considering uh, procedural and distributive equity considerations around community benefits. Um, industry groups have also indicated a desire for um, benefit provisions to be included in analyses and to be kind of more um, a, a piece of the picture. Um, so like I said, we're being asked to engage in these conversations kind of from a number of fronts. We also recognize that directing benefits to underserved communities um, is broadly part of a just energy transition, which as we know is currently an administration priority. And finally, as COSA and others are aware, and as we've heard from, from uh, Rodney and others, BOEM has other emerging program areas we will need to engage on now and in the future. And this study, while it's written to focus on renewable energy, could provide useful information or a study model for other programs. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, I know this slide is uh, messy and I won't spend a lot of time here. This is just some additional background information. Um, you can see a few examples of recent news headlines on established community benefit provisions, just to get a little sampling of, of what's out there. And then I included a virtual whiteboard from a brainstorming exercise that was part of a discussion exploring topics around community benefit mechanisms in a recent environmental justice forum for the New York bite wind leases. Some of the themes expressed here center on uh, process or pathways by which benefit mechanisms are developed transparency and accountability throughout the entire process, including through implementation of benefit programs, recommendations for best practices for working collaboratively with communities on developing provi benefit provisions. Um, so you can get a sense that there is a lot going on already in the space and a high level of interest in the topic. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, so the study objectives, as you can see, are to provide a comprehensive understanding of the content of community benefit provisions and the process by which they have been implemented for offshore renewable energy in the US and abroad. Explore key themes, issues of concerns, typical benefits, potential lessons learned and good practices from existing um, benefit programs. Provide information on impacts of community benefit provisions that can inform environmental assessments help BOEM better communicate its role and authority in response to calls for community benefits during engagement with impacted communities, and provide impact on good practice principles for community benefit provision. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so the methods of the study consist of a literature review, a systematic review of existing community benefit provisions, 
and targeted direct engagement with individuals familiar with a subset of the benefit provisions who can speak to outcomes and impacts of the existing programs. I want to mention here that we may, um, you know, if the study continues to progress, we may adjust the methods to really build off and complement other existing research efforts. We've had some fairly recent conversations with colleagues at the Department of Energy, Wind Energy Technologies Office, and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory about a somewhat similar study that they're conducting, and we would certainly continue uh, coordination um, if the study moves forward um, to you know, continue to provide value to the information learned. We plan to cast a wide net with the literature review and include information from other industries, including oil and gas, as well as uh, other geographic areas beyond the United States. We would connect, collect as much information as possible related to existing benefit provisions, um, and work with a researcher to agree on a method of systematic analysis of materials to explore topics um, such as how the you know, programs came about, were they voluntary on the part of the developer, tied to a local land use approval, et cetera. Uh, avenues of benefit disbursement, beneficiaries, uh, and also potentially key groups who did not receive benefits, um, if that proves to be you know, proves to be a topic of um, to explore. Uh, subsequent information on outcomes and impacts, you know, for pub published information on existing programs. And finally, as I said, the study would follow up on outcomes um, by engaging directly with a subset of individuals who can speak directly to certain programs. Um, the information would be synthesized into a report that could provide the basis for uh, good practice resources that BOEM can make available um, and then you know, provide sort of, like we said, help us engage in this topic that people are, are asking us to engage on. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so the research questions, um, as you can see, are what sort of equity programs have been implemented to date in the US and abroad? Uh, what are the lessons learned from existing efforts? What are the pathways by which benefit mechanisms get developed? How do community benefit provisions affect the outcomes, perceptions of effectiveness and fairness, and other metrics? Should community benefit provisions be considered in environmental analyses, and if so, how? Uh, what principles or good practices can BOEM identify to, related to community benefit provisions that can be provided to our stakeholders? Uh, and a final potential question that isn't shown here um, could be, you know, what additional efforts could be made to address outstanding gaps in research or capacity to engage in this topic. Um, so with that, I'm happy to hear feedback from the committee and take any questions. And I would invite Laura also to jump in if you'd like to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan. Thank you. Apologies, I was having a difficult time getting my microphone on. Um, I will take a moment now to look for hands and I can see there's a number already. Um, so we'll start with Hillary and then Jeremy, Rona, and then uh, Rob Griffin. Hi everyone, um, thanks for the opportunity. Um, uh, my name's Hillary Boudet, I'm at Oregon State University. Um, I had a couple of comments about the uh, literature review. So I think, um, uh, first of all, I think this topic is really important. And so I'm glad you're focused on it as part of the studies development plan. Um, one of the things that you mentioned is doing like a broader literature review into the um, CSR literature and good governance literature. And I actually think there's probably enough coming out of Europe and other places and and onshore develop from onshore development using community benefits agreements and community benefits funds that you could probably get enough out of that literature without having to go to a broader uh, literature around this topic, um, and including lots of stuff about best practices from international development and also even um, urban development around stadiums and things like that. So I think what might be more useful is to think specifically about what's different um, related to offshore versus onshore. And, and I think that might be a really good focus for that uh, piece. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to mention is um, there's quite a bit in there about process and the process of development, developing the community benefits agreements. I think another thing to focus on would be timing and when those negotiations occur. And because there's um, so particularly out here in Oregon, there's some concern about timing of talking about 
community benefits um, well. Uh, there's still concern about the lease areas, the actual location of the lease areas. And so I think it might be interesting to look at timing in addition to process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hillary. Uh, next on the list, I'll call on Jeremy. And then we've got quite a, a long group after that. So I'm just going to ask folks to try to keep their comments um, fairly brief so that we can ensure that all of the folks with their hands raised have an opportunity. Yeah, uh, good morning. Uh, again, I, I would echo that I think this is a really critical study, and I'm really glad to see that it's relatively high up on the, the uh, priority list. Um, I would recommend highly uh, the written comments of, of Claire Haggett uh, and and uh, Bonnie Ram, uh, who both submitted written comments, real, very very detailed, particularly uh, Claire's. Um, I I think you you've got really good research questions. I think that's the strength of this uh, proposal. Uh, I think the equity may be almost a separate study. I think the budget is quite small overall, um, and you may need a larger uh, budget. Uh, some of it may be duplicative of what DOE is in the process of funding too. So uh, they're going to at least announce probably internally those awards uh, to the winners maybe in, in August. Uh, you might be able to get coordinate with your, your friends in WETO. Uh, to find out what exactly those are so that you can perhaps fill some gaps uh, rather than being uh, duplicative. Um, one thing you didn't mention is recognition justice. Um, and one of the issues is who's not included. So you're, you've got a, a lot of emphasis on what who who's getting these, but who's not getting these uh, and, and why. Um, and and that that's a lot of uh, the justice question uh, as well. So uh, with that, I'll I'll turn it over because there is a long list of people. Thank you. There is, which is wonderful. Thank you. We'll go uh, to Rona, Rob, David, Gavin, and then Carrie. Thanks, Megan, for a really interesting um, presentation, and, and as Jeremy saying, very important project. Not I'm not there. I'm not there. I'm not there. Okay. Um, somebody's not muted. There's somebody in the room. Okay. There we go. Um, so a couple of things. One, I, I would like to see in a little bit more detail, and I'm sure this is stuff that you're thinking about on on how you would collect the information about um, what pro community provisions uh, projects there are out there, because I imagine that there's an enormous range in how these things are reported and documented and um, uh, and you know what can be found where. And, and that is related to my second point, which is about the scale. I imagine that there is a vast difference in the scale of some of these projects. Uh, and I think that would be a really important thing to bear in mind. Um, uh, the, the, and also the ratio, the relationship between scale of project and scale of community, because those things may not also be uh, directly correlated if that makes sense. Thanks, Rona. We'll turn to Rob. Thanks for having me. I'm uh, Rob Griffin. I'm with UMass Dartmouth and uh, Natural Capital Project at Stanford. Uh, thanks for the invitation to speak on this interesting topic. Uh, I have some longer comments, but I'll um, hopefully be able to share them with you uh, by email and just encapsulate sort of main theme I'm thinking of when I was reading this was that uh, maybe some orientation in the objectives around uh, taking a, a step back and not presupposing that the idea of including community benefits is a good idea in the first place. And I'm thinking about this from the perspective of, you know, they can be costly for a segment of societies that um, is being affected. So in the, sli the slideshow, there was the example of uh, $180 million uh, community benefit projects, and you know that's 10% or roughly there of the cost of an entire capital cost of an operations cost of an entire wind farm, and you know that could raise the prices for ratepayers, could potentially delay the construction or you know implementation of 
um, these projects just due to higher costs. And so, you know, we don't get all the benefits that we might from reduced climate change effects, et cetera. And so taking a step back and thinking, you know, considering this is in a, a thick market where there's lots of options for developers and they're kind of, you know, to some extent subjected to monopoly type conditions where these coastal communities have a large influence over what they can do. Um, you know, those sorts of conditions aren't ripe for efficient outcomes from an economics perspective generally. And so my recommendations here are to include some thinking about whether this makes sense at all and what objective BOEM is supporting uh, by, you know, implicitly endorsing this potentially or normalizing the process of doing this. And then also to, you know, to ideally have some folks with an economics background as part of the consulting team doing this, because there's a lot of potential bad incentives here and inefficiencies. And it appears to even be linked partly now to the lease sale stipulation process, which has got a lot of other uh, reasons for concern, you know, given that that's a whole different animal and um, is complicated on its own. Thanks for giving me the time, appreciate it. Thanks for joining us, Rob. Next, we'll turn to uh, David and then to Gavin and then Carrie. Hi, yeah, I, this is such necessary research right now. The phrase that's being bantered around um, around community benefits is wild west um, at this point. Um, and so anything that sort of catalogs what's happening, I would say that while BOEM may not have a great deal of jurisdiction for requiring community benefits, I think part of this review could be what sort of policy structures have been used in other places in terms of regulating um, or coming up with uh, criteria for community benefits, because I know some European countries have guidelines um, and guidance or uh, regulation. I would say another important component is overall this idea of defining community. And when we talk about community benefits, we have to understand whether we're talking about geographic communities, communities of interest, or particularly you think about some of the work on communities at sea and what that means in terms of who is, who is accruing costs and who's accruing benefits. Um, and then just one more comment, um, the, the budget is, is relatively small, but this may be an opportunity to really think in terms of like comparative case study methods, um, instead of trying to find out what's going on everywhere, but coming up with some sort of criteria for selecting cases, and then really understanding what was done, how things were defined, and what outcomes are perceived as having come from that. Thank you. Thank you, David. Next, we'll hear from Gavin and then Carrie. And thanks for the opportunity to talk. Um, my name is Gavin Fay. I'm at UMass Dartmouth. I'm a socio-ecological systems modeler, ecosystem modeling. Um, I think this is, I, I just echo what other people have said. I think this is a really critical project in terms of thinking about um, uh, these issues and how to include them. I think the idea of creating this uh, from Bohm's perspective of having a resource that is available, I think that's really, really seems um, like it would be useful. I think echoing some of what uh, Jeremy and Hillary said about perhaps stressing, trying to think about what's different about this rather than other things, I think is really valuable. And I think that includes perhaps, you know, um, can you think when you're doing your review, can you think of ways of ensuring that things that haven't worked or haven't happened, haven't happened before are still considered in this process? I know that's really hard to do. Um, but, um, you know, if there's an avenue within this project for thinking about, you know, some transformative pro type work that could be different from what's happened before, because you know, we may have, we may, we, we certainly are dealing with uh, populations and socioeconomic systems that are slightly different from other places. And I, I think thinking how we can represent that is good. I think the idea of thinking about expected outcomes, being able to document those. So for the various community benefits mechanisms, I think really, you know, if, if this project could sort of 
map those to what the expected outcomes of those might be and how they might interact with other mechanisms or other socio-economic uh, or even ecological objectives or and including costs and who's burden bearing those costs as david just said i think that would be really you know a valuable to outcome for one of a better word for the for the project so um, yeah really glad to see this thanks gavin carrie Yeah, thanks very much, Megan, and uh, and commenters before me for your um, for your comments. Um, this has all been really great. A lot of what I had in mind has been covered. I, I'll touch on a few quick points. Um, who is the community? Um, there are many different communities, and some people fit in multiple communities. So. Um, Society is super complex, and in this context, you have communities place and interest, the communities at sea, et cetera. So um, thinking about the relevance of that understanding to the notion of community benefit agreements and in evaluating this idea and pursuing this work, I think is really worthwhile. Um, I had a short note about equity versus community benefit agreements. And I think some, I think Jeremy, you pointed out that equity is a different, is a whole nother study. Uh, maybe it wasn't for Jeremy, but someone did and it was great. Um, these, what I've heard from these agreements being developed in, in various contexts to date, there's been a whole lot of contention, or, excuse me, around some of them. And it's sort of who's in, who's out. And that point was raised as well. I, I think um, in looking to the literature and seeking to understand what these experiences have been so far and what might be appropriate to, to develop in the way of guidance going forward, let's say, or, or um, other mechanisms, um, it would be uh, really helpful to address timing issues, process issues, um, who is included and who is not and how that is handled. Um, and then uh, recognizing that there are many different communities, so to speak, and again, I hate using this word, that have a stake in, in community benefit agreements and how that might play out. Um, and I think it's a really complicated beast, and I think it's important that that be reckoned with, and this is a great opportunity to do that. Um, being careful not to start from the get-go of, of having very discrete categories of things and looking to um, understand where there may be overlap or uh, connectedness within and among um, these different notions of community and how that would play out for community benefit agreements. And ultimately, you know, the who's in, who's out also has implications for um, how, how benefits are distributed and how costs are distributed. Um, and that's been touched on a bit. I think that's a critical element of every aspect of what BOEM is involved in really. Um, and so to be able to, um, to look at this and incorporate that understanding into this look at things that community benefit agreements would be, would be really worthwhile. That's it, thanks. Thank you. And Megan, I wanna make sure to give you an opportunity to either respond to uh, any of the feedback you've heard or to ask any follow-up questions as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, and you, you've given me a lot, <laughs> so given us a lot to think through. So we really appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to receiving the written comments as well. Um, just one point, and I'll, I'll throw it out there, just if there's not time to answer, that's fine. But, um, you know, we were, I was, you know, we were kind of keeping this pretty broad and not necessarily focusing right on these negotiated agreement um, pieces and trying to include, um, you know, these other kind of voluntary investment um, efforts that developers might be involved with. Um, would, I, what would, coast, you know, what would everybody's kind of reaction be to that? Because I feel like the discussion has jumped straight to, you know, looking at the kind of more formalized negotiated agreements versus kind of keeping it pretty broad. Um, Everybody doesn't have to answer, but if one person has time to take it, I would appreciate that. Yeah, I'll give a moment for any hands in response. Carrie, Carrie go ahead. Um, thanks, Megan, for 
grounding us again. Uh, and, and that's really helpful, actually. I, for one, um, would, I think thinking more broadly is really valuable. Um, partly because you can use one mechanism if you prioritize one mechanism or you look at just one mechanism and what's been accomplished or not and what can be learned from that, I think that can be really valuable, but there are a lot of ways of doing things and there are a lot of contexts, right? And so, um, and, and sometimes the other types of arrangements, perhaps less formal, are actually more productive uh, and more satisfying to different groups of people and might not engender the same kind of um, tension, might still engender that, but, um, but it's, it's worth a consideration. Um, so if I'm understanding you correctly, I, I'm appreciating it. And I think thinking broadly is worthwhile, especially because even for different ways of doing things, there are a lot of uh, design principles, if you will, that can be distilled from different types of arrangements and different processes and just seeing how they've played out uh, and learning from people who have had that experience. So thank you. Did anybody else want to provide Megan any feedback on that before we get ready to break for the lunch? David, go ahead. I just, I, I agree with Carrie. I mean, I think it's good to go broad and in some ways that becomes an empirical question, right? Are the formal CBAs better or worse or really basically the same as these other kinds of, of arrangements? Excellent. And Hillary, I'll give you the last word. Yeah, I just I I a word of caution is that literature is very big. So I think, you know, just still, but it might be that the the best practices and principles are very similar. So you know, I don't, it would be a, you know, kind of a look-see first, I think, to see, are you going to gain a lot more from, from adding all that to your review or, yeah, or get the same thing back. Well, thank you each. We have made up a, a fair bit of time over the last uh, couple of profiles. And um, this is always the uncomfortable part of our meetings where we uh, are in-person meetings. Uh, we break for lunch and unfortunately I have to tell the feds in the room that we cannot feed you. <laughs> uh, um, so we do have lunch for the committee members catered, um, but uh, we do have an hour for lunch. And um, if it makes a difference uh, to those that have to go out to get any, we'll make sure to start back at 1.40 instead of 1.30. Um, instead of 135. So please take the extra five minutes. Um, but uh, we look forward to joining then. My suggestion for folks that are on the Zoom is that you just go ahead and turn off your camera and your um, the mics in the room. But if you prefer to log out and log back in, you're welcome to do that as well. And for those on the line, thank you for joining. Uh, we will reconvene at 140. <laughs> Welcome back to our annual uh, meeting focused on committee input to the studies development plan process for BOEM. Uh, hopefully most folks that were on that are on the line were with us for this morning session as well. Um, but we've covered two of the profiles coming out of um, the Office of Environmental Programs. Uh, and now in our um, post-lunch session, we'll turn to the third from them. And I think I'm turning to uh, Jake for that. So Jake, if you're ready, uh, we might be missing one or two folks in the room, but hopefully they'll be able to join us shortly. And I'll, I'd like to keep us as on time as possible. So go right hey, ahead. Sounds good. Can, it, can you hear me okay and everything? Great. Well, you know, uh, it's exciting to be able to present. Oh, it's weird seeing myself on screen. Uh, okay. It's, uh, uh, you know, one thing I really enjoy about working uh, in OEP uh, is how we're always striving to find better ways to do our assessments. Uh, it's something that I learned early in my, my career with BOEM. And uh, what I really like about studies is how we always uh, push ourselves to do sort of comprehensive and innovative science uh, that's still cost effective. 
And I think you'll find that this study uh, uh, on using dimethyl sulfide uh, gradients to predict North Atlantic right whale occurrence sort of follows that same, same uh, theme of uh, innovative, uh, cost-effective, and, and really uh, top-notch science. Um, uh, and so I thought uh, what, I, what I'm hoping to share from this is that uh, to give you a brief run through through the study, obviously, um, and that what I hope, and I think the stakeholders that submitted this as a study concept uh, uh, as well, uh, is that this study can fill an important niche in, uh, in right, what we do for mitigating uh, impacts to North Atlantic right whales. Uh, and uh, one where we'll hopefully have another tool to really predict the occurrence of these critically endangered species with finer temporal and spatial accuracy than the tools we currently, currently have. So uh, let's go into it here. Uh, so the information need, um, well, why do we need this study? Uh, really much of the on the water mitigation methods are limited to reactive uh, approaches. There, an animal appears in an area and, and we react accordingly. Uh, what, what I mean by that is by the time they're detected in real time passive acoustic monitoring or detected in visual observations, it's sort of like a surprise, I'm here kind of moment. Uh, uh, an impact may have already hurt, occurred, the animal is already in the area. And it's important to point out here that mother calf pairs are the most susceptible to vessel collisions, but using passive acoustic monitoring, which, which we depend on highly for mitigation, is limited for this segment of the population. In fact, uh, Susan Parks uh, has a great paper about acoustic crypsis uh, some years ago uh, in North Atlantic right whales. And this segment of the population that's most vulnerable to ship strikes are not very acoustically active. Uh, so it's concerning because in any endangered species, it's the moms that have a critical role in stabilizing the population. And so what is the study objective and research question here? Uh, it's to identify the thresholds of uh, DMS concentrations that we can, we can use to predict uh, aggregations and dissipation of North Atlantic right whales. And basically, can we use DMS to identify where those thresholds are at which these animals aggregate? And so what is DMS? Now the 12-year-old the immature boy that sits on my shoulder whenever I read these things would say to you, it's, say it's, it's plankton farts, uh, but that's not what it is. Uh, it's, a, a, it's a gas that's used to maintain the internal osmotic pressure in phytoplankton. Uh, when zooplankton consume phytoplankton, uh, the D level of DMS increases. And right whales seem to show up uh, whenever DMS density and zooplankton density reaches a certain threshold. Uh, uh, and what's really cool about DMS is that it's detectable from space, but also sensors in the field that can be vessel-based or AUV-based or, or whatever, or even buoy-based. Imagine uh, sensors that we can have that are constantly mo monitoring this fluctuating uh, gas. And I think what's really important here to, to see is that uh, North Atlantic right whale behavior uh, makes visual observation challenging even on the calmest days. And this is a video a friend of mine took during a glass calm day during Michael Moore and Carolyn Miller's photogrammetry research on Cape Cod Bay. <laughs> now this is a glass calm day. Uh, and what you really can't see here is the right whale that's just off the bow. You can sort of see it right there, just surfacing. Um, but uh, these animals, even on the best case circumstances are really hard to spot. And even with a drone image here that you'll see in a second, you can see the animals that hang out just below the surface of the water. But even drones have a limited endurance for visual observation. And it's pretty clear that right whales can be easily missed in, in visual detections. So how would we go about doing this study? Uh, we continuously monitor DMS values in the water and count whales along a track. And so we'd conduct the same track before North Atlantic right whales aggregate starting in January every other week and count whales, add survey data and collect DMS data with the, with the goal of identifying uh, those thresholds, those DMS thresholds, the DMS, the finer DMS thresholds uh, that we can ident that identify the, the aggregation or dissipation of, of animals. So what is the DMS value like just before right whales show up and what's it like when, right when they leave? Uh, and we would then uh, ground truth this data. We would, with, with, uh, we would use remote sensing data and ground truth the data that we collect on the vessel uh, to look at, uh, can we uh, get finer scale predictions out of what we collect currently uh, that's remote sensed, uh, remote, uh, remotely sensed, basically refine that algorithm uh, to work better, which we know works for other, other areas as well. And I guess what I wanted to show, what I wanted to show, you know, when I first presented the study at, at uh, uh, for BOEM uh, a, a couple, a year or two ago now, uh, uh, we wanted to do, you know, do some pilots because this seemed like a sort of out there idea with a lot of risk to it. 
And so what we believe really is that uh, animals are actively using the info gradient. They're using, actively in, uh, using smell uh, to find those dense patches of prey. Uh, and over the past few years, Bohm and Noah have supported pilot studies looking at DMS and the occurrence of co copepod feeding whales. Uh, and so we have uh, had three or four different studies uh, on copepod feeding whales, Cape Cod Bay in 2021 and 22, uh, right whales that are south of the island, south of Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket uh, in 2022. And also in 22, we did a, a, a bone funded study on say whales um, in, at, the, at the Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. And on this next uh, slide here, we'll show you a map. And what you're looking at here is the combined results of a few of these studies. Um, uh, mainly combining the say whale and right whale surveys. So the green, yellow, and red represent uh, concentrations of DMS, and the black or blue Xs represent say and right whale occurrences. And so what you can see here is that uh, most of those Xs, if you look uh, uh, closely, uh, are occurring in areas where there is high, uh, high DMS. Uh, if you look at that top uh, left of the photo, you can see the blue check marks for say whales, and down at the bottom there, uh, where the red circles are, you can see the black check marks for right whales, uh, looking at correlation between those two, uh, two animals or two, two, uh, two values. And so the, really my point in this presentation is that uh, it's gonna sound cheesy or maybe it sounds a little cliche, but we can do better um, and we can do better for right whales. You know, seasonal limitations have their limits and we now know right whales are largely around all the time. Uh, there, we've seen several uh, papers that have, that have observed them visually and detected them acoustically. Um, and then acoustic monitoring, uh, in our, you know, which is an important aspect of our, our mitigation toolbox that we have, um, uh, it, does, it may not address the mother and calves most at risk of vessel strikes. Uh, you know, we have tools like satellite monitoring, but uh, you know, in, in real time or uh, on cloudy days or timelessness, timeliness, uh, it may not be effective. And so we could be doing more to enable effective dynamic management of right whales and wind energy areas uh, using uh, dimethyl sulfide. And so using the study to, to identify what those thresholds are uh, is the next, next sort of obvious quest, uh, uh, step in the, in the way to make this a reality. So that's really, uh, that's my presentation and, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Jake. I'm gonna look around the room and online to see if there are any hands. Uh, Susan? Hi. Uh, hi, Jake. Thanks for, for a good presentation. I, I think it's really exciting um, broadly to be able to use this to predict locations of aggregations of top predators, not just right whales. I'm partial to right whales, but um, I think other organisms in the habitat might be also of interest, right? Like other, other top predators that would be feeding on it. I had two quick questions for you. One is, could you provide any more detail about the potential for satellite remote sensing of DMS? So sort of like vessel-based surveys would be sort of, you know, slow and to cover a region. But um, if you had any other information about the remote sensing with satellite and the potential for that. Um, I, so I have some remote sensing information. It's funny, I, I cut out a couple of my slides because I was worried about time. And of course, my remote sensing satellite slide is one of the ones that I deleted that I, I wish I could pull up right now. Um, so if you don't mind, Susan, can I can I follow up with you by email uh, uh, with with that information? I don't I don't know if I have a whole lot of great information except for um, you know been in touch with the folks at NASA that have been doing the the uh, remote sensing analysis and um, have a few papers and things like that on, on the remote sensing. You know, uh, uh, fine tuning the algorithm uh, to to get better predictions. Um, we've just had conversations about that conceptually, um, uh, and so I don't have you know a whole lot of really clear methods on how, how that would work right in front of me. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that's totally fine, but I think it's something to, to keep in mind, like with the, if you're getting baseline data, it'd be really useful to directly to connect that to the existing models, like the DMS models right now, just use um, essentially, I think chlorophyll A and the photosynthetically available radiation. So there are already sensors that are there. So that would be really interesting. Um, the second quick question I wanted to just ask about too is, so you talk about the concentration threshold for DMS for these aggregations. And I also wonder about including uh, temporal aspects of the DMS. Um, so like when you're doing these, these linear transects, you're getting a snapshot and you're getting snapshots of the animal presence. But um, presumably if it's 
being released through grazing of the phytoplankton, there may also be a diel trend, right? Like with movement in the water column. And so it, the, the time of day might actually matter. If you're doing vessel-based visual surveys, you're also probably just out during the day on, in relatively calm sea states. And so just thinking about getting some data on the temporal at variation of the DMS would be interesting as well. Okay. You guys. Somebody else hears that sound too, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Just make sure. I was kind of struggling to hear some of Susan. I just want to make sure that wasn't just in my head. Okay. Yeah, we had some noise interruption here in the, in the room. Um, so thank you for bearing with us as we get that taken care of. Um, we've got Les, Katrine, and Kevin with their hands up. So Les, we'll turn to you next. Yeah. Hi, Jake. That was, that was a great presentation. Um, what impresses me about this study is that my understanding it's going for exactly the data that are needed to um, perfect the algorithm for going from chlorophyll A to D DMS, because we're not detecting DMS remotely directly. Um, and uh, so this is like a, a surgical operation to improve that link. And, and I, I can't imagine anything more important right now. Our models for a white right well distribution don't take into account non-feeding activities and knowing where they last fed can help with that tremendously. Right. Yep. Thanks, Les. Thank you, Les. We've got a few more folks with their hands up. We'll go to Katrine, Kevin, and then uh, Matt. Yeah, thanks, that was really interesting. Um, I was wondering sort of what is the time delay that you would have between actually processing any kind of remotely sensed signal between knowing that actual location, knowing the threshold, and then maybe going there and ground truth that the whale was really there. Yeah, that's, so, that's a great what, question. So, so I don't know if we have a clear answer to that question. Okay. Uh, that, that's part of the, I think would have to be part of the research, obviously. Um, okay. uh, but that's, that's like the first reaction that people often ask me when I, when I talk about this is that, that what is that temporal delay? And, and um, so that would absolutely be, 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 it's a great question and would have to be part of the research. And I mean, I think sort of for ground truth and you could probably figure this out by having, you know, vessels in the area or comparing it with the PAM data or something like right. this. But um, if you want to use this as a response tool or something like this, when let's say something happens and then you need to know where the whales were, um, you know, if, if you need to, that, so then I, that time delay might become more critical. Right, so I see it as a continuum, right? We, we, we obviously, we, we do the study and answer some of those questions about the time delay and, 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 and refining the remote sensing before it can be obviously become any kind of mitigation tool or anything like that. Yeah, um, of course. So yeah, of so there, there are a bunch of questions to yeah, answer yeah, first. Yeah. And, yeah. Thanks, I, that, I, I, was, I, I knew that question was gonna come up and. Uh... <laughs> Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah. Hi, Jacob, thank you very much for, for the presentation. So I, I, I got a couple of questions. The first r relates to your, uh, your, your map where it looked like there were some uh, red dots that did not have uh, X's or uh, associated with them. Is that right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a, a good point. So uh, there are definitely occurrences of where DMS was detected um, and whales weren't detected. Um, but the majority of, of when the DMS is high, whales are, detect whales are detected more often than not. So part of refining the detectability there would have to come in, in under, you know, this, this is a very broad map right now. I think it needs to be, you know, if we could tighten up what those thresholds are, that would be what, what, what the study would accomplish. Right. And, and you think that perhaps some of that might be observer error on, on the fact you can't see the whales, not that they're not there. I, oh, it, it, yeah, it could be or yeah. availability bias or anything like that. Sure. But there's, there's no other way that this gas is released uh, than, than feeding? Not that I know of. Uh, uh, not, not that I know of. Uh, I don't uh. know. The, the second question I, I have, I, I was talking to Stormy Mayo, who works on uh, right whales a lot and, and, and has presented to this committee before, and he was telling me that the work they're doing, they, it really seems that the right whale needs to feed on, on aggregations of these copepods, like, like high, yeah. it, it, there's a threshold to, to how viable it is for the animal for feeding. Those maps suggest very wide distribution of, of copepod um, 
uh, aggregations. I mean, they're, they're, I, I was surprised to see it because I thought that, that the copepods would be much more aggregated. Do you think that reflects the aggregation of it? or I, if not? I, I think it does. I love Stormy's research. And Stormy and I have had a ton of conversations about the getting to uh, uh, zooplankton's density uh, where it's energetically worthwhile to, to feed. Um, I think that those maps, I mean, just my gut tells me, I think that that is uh, relevant of, of, of density. Um, uh, there would be big gaps in density. I don't know what the time frame is there, though, between the check marks uh, in, this, in this map. Um, I don't know offhand. So uh, it could be that, the, that we're looking at, um, you know, the, that like the southern right whale track there. I'm not sure what the timeline is on those red, you know, what the red is to the to compared to the dots that are seen there, the X's that are seen there. All right. All right. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. No, that's a good question. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Matthew. Yeah. Hi. <clears throat> Thanks uh, for the presentation and for the invitation uh, to to talk here with you all. Uh, a lot of my work was on my PhD work was on P, uh, DMS in the marine food web. So this is really exciting work to, to see be brought to, uh, to sort of a management funding discussion like this. I will say that um, to me, it seems as though like there's, there's still a debate in the literature if and how these large whales can sense anything with their olfactory or gustatory senses. So how they use chemical senses at all, they have reduced olfactory um, neuroanatomy so presumably they are able to detect this stuff, but even that is not certain uh, at this time. And so I was wondering if there were any plans, because I think what would be really neat about to use this DMS in sort of a, uh, a modeling framework where you look at the power of including these DMS concentrations in model, predictive models for right whale presence. Uh, and you can use things uh, like abiotic variables like bathymetry or ocean temperature or thing, things like that. Biotic variables of ind indicative of lower trophic level activity like chlorophyll A, DMS, and then combine it with passive acoustics, even though they tend to be quiet there, sightings, things like that. Yeah. And there are models from the U.S. West Coast that do this pretty, pretty well. Um, like if you're familiar with whalesafe.com, that's the whale... That's the, a really, really cool sort of modeling product um, uh, the Benioff uh, Ocean Initiative funds on the West Coast to mitigate ship strike to blue whales. And it includes predictive forward-looking models using abiotic and biotic variables. And it'd be really, really neat to do this, something like this, to add this to the West Coast if there's um, the sensor ability to detect these DMS, agri you know, sort of accumulations there or to use this on the east coast um to use that modeling framework on the east coast for right well so is anything like that being done uh you know it's it's great to hear you say that because i'm smiling i don't need to have a goofy science geek smile right now i kind of can't help it because um really uh my my vision in my head when i close my eyes and picture that that sort of what that dynamic dashboard is it's very similar to what's going on on the west coast you know with, with like uh, uh remember uh elliot hazen's whale watch stuff from yeah a while yeah. back right that same yeah. thing um, uh, so when I, when I close my eyes and I think about what is, what did we do for right whales? It's that, it's that dynamic dashboard that brings in all those factors together. Um, yes. and in a, in a one-stop shop, um, um, because right now these, you know, these products are scattered all over the place. Um, and, you know, it wouldn't it be cool to, to bring in everything that you just said, but also, you know, be able to like, you know, look back because we have right whale, you know, survey history and, and passive acoustic monitoring history and all that stuff. Uh, to, to go back and, and look at, you know, historical uh, uh, correlations and whatnot in the data as well. So um, I guess for financial and capacity reasons and things like that, um, uh, that sort of dashboard view isn't included in this. Um, but uh, if if I could, you know, uh, snap snap my fingers and make all the money appear, uh, uh, you know, in the world, then uh, th that would be the, the sort of the next step for me. Yeah. But yeah, that I, it's, it's nice to hear you, you Think along those same lines. Yeah, and I see there's a comment in the well chat here where it basically says that yeah, DMS is this kind of this link between these lower level processes, abiotic processes, basically like why whales might aggregate in certain areas. And so yeah. I think it would be really interesting to to basically add this into the models that it seems like they may already exist for right whales. I haven't seen a lot of them, but I'm more of a West Coast. Uh, you know, I I don't, I don't know as much as what's going on, on the East Coast. 
at, at this level of detail. But yeah, adding DMS in there and seeing how it improves model accuracy or model performance would be really cool um, to see if DMS would be management ready to, to add this into a management tool. Um, yeah, I, I guess right now it sort of strikes me as more basic science, which is really interesting, but I'm, it's unclear to me how management ready it is at this time, yeah. but it could be. Yeah, uh, uh, no, I, I, I agree with you. This is sort of uh, answering those sort of basic questions that we need to answer first, but and then feed them into the into the models. Um, I think right. this has huge West Coast applicability too. Uh, I, I was focusing this on right whales because of the priority, you know, uh, uh, yeah. you know, for North Atlantic right whales. But I mean, you know, we know about the correlations with birds and other predators, and, yep. and so there's there's a lot that that would that this would all fit, fit into for sure. Great. Well, yeah, happy to chat more with you all if you ever want to get yeah. in touch offline. I work with Ellie and those folks at, uh, over at NOAA on the West Coast, and I'm sure they'd oh, be awesome. excited about applying this type of stuff on the East Coast if there were interest or funding to do so. So anyway, thanks awesome. for the opportunity. Great to be here. Great. Thanks for the questions. Matthew, thank you for joining us. I'm going to turn next to Scott, Rona, and then Les. So that's a very in interesting presentation. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jake. And, and uh, I want to follow up on question uh, first that Kevin asked, and then that one, a point that Susan made. Um, so I'm looking at this map here. Uh, so Kevin noted there was there were some red dots, uh, which I guess are the, the high concentrations of DMS where there are no whales. There's also down there uh, in the corner, some green dots where there's a, look like there's a lot of whales. And so uh, it's, it's it's the area where the blow up is, right? The blow up. The green dots where there's a lot. Of yeah, there's a bunch of checks with the green dots. Oh with, yeah, yeah, with yeah. the inset. Yeah. 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 So so you got kind of. Uh, I'm just kind of just just as I look at this data here, I'm I'm not quite getting the sense that the correlation is all so, that great. Well, what this isn't showing is that the lack of whales when there's no DMS. So like when there's no DMS on years where there's no DMS uh -huh. or at times when there's no DMS, there are no whales in the, okay. in, the in the data. Okay, so um, okay. good. Okay, so the, the the and the other my other question kind of gets to Susan's, which is the romance of this struck me as the proposal was the remote sensing aspect that you could like do this from space and we could we could get big survey of, of information. Yep. Is is the it's also one of the most expensive proposals in the in the plan yep uh, if not this i think it made the second most expensive proposal um and i'm just trying to is it to get more data of the type we're seeing right here for this kind of ship ship and i think it's, it's or, the, or is it to is it to include the remote sensing study aspects as well what's it's, it's well i think mainly in the in the cost proposal the, how i came up to the 1.9 was the uh if there's a lot of vessel and auv based DMS so, the, the, so so the testing of the, the kind of the the romance part of it, the the remote sensing stuff, is not part of this proposal. No, there, this there's is, definitely a remote sensing element, but it's the majority of the cost came from the vessel and AUV based. What's the remote sensing element? Is it? Oh, the, offhand, I don't, I don't know. I have the budget in front of me here. But, I'm sorry. What? 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 You mean what? Cost wise, or what? Well, what? what no, what's the scope of the work? If the, the satellite, I mean, there was some mention about the satellite remote sensing. So right? it's really just to ground. So basically, to take the. Uh, what we ground truth, what we do, but what we sample in the in the field to ground truth by what's detected remotely. That's really the the okay. the, the limitation of the remote sensing stuff now. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank you. I'll turn next to Rona. Um, so this is really, really interesting stuff and, and not something I know much about, but my question is in part um and this speaks also to what Matthew was saying about linking with abiotic and biotic factors. Uh, are current, is current activity um, explicitly brought into your thinking about how these, I presume the copepods will get wrapped by currents and so mm -hmm. the dimethyl sulfide will get wrapped mm -hmm. by currents. And then um, are these, it's easy to spot phytoplankton aggregations from space, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether copepods uh, automatically show up wherever there are phytoplankton blooms, but are there ways to use remote sensing data and other visual indicators that might be easier to access than the dimethyl sulfate remote sensing data to tie into some of the field data you're collecting and think about ways to figure out where these copepod aggregations are for the whales? Yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 I don't have a good answer for that offhand. 
Um, but I, I'm just, I'm writing this down. I'm thinking and writing down at the same time. Sorry. Um, uh, because uh, when when this profile was coming forward, we were looking at why couldn't we use chlorophyll and and you know what would be the differences between DMS and chlorophyll and the, getting to that finer temporal and spatial mm -hmm. uh, 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 outlook. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't have a good answer for you on that. Thank you, Rona. Les? Les, you're muted. Thanks, Stacy. Um, I'm not directly involved in this study, but I am a member of the uh, Stellwagen Bank Sanctuary Research Team, so we've discussed this a lot. And I just wanted to point out that even though the proposal is not that explicit about the remote sensing side, um, the sanctuary staff are extremely adept at that and thinking about it all the time. And I'm quite certain that that link would be a major part of the work. Excellent. Any other questions or comments, thoughts in the room? Any other questions, comments, or thoughts online? All right. Um, I understand that uh, Mary Boatman, who's presenting uh, the introduction for the OREP group, may be running a few minutes behind. So um, I think what we will do in that case is go ahead uh, with the um, profile presentation from the Office of Renewable Energy Programs, um, and we'll give Mary the opportunity to do her introduction as soon as uh, we have heard the profile. Um, so with that, if you're ready, I think John's online to present. Is that right? And he's presenting on Bright City and Grand Engines. So um, with that, uh, I think we may have uh, some folks on the line that are not muted too. If I could just ask folks to please mute yourself if you are not speaking. Um, and John, we'll give you the opportunity to go and then we'll uh, allow Mary her time as soon as we've uh, concluded with the profile itself. Okay, can you hear me? We can and it's very good to see you. Great, great. I am uh, in Syracuse, New York, just finishing my annual leave. Um, hi everyone. Um, I am John Primo, a senior social scientist uh, with the National Office of Environmental Studies. I am presenting in place of my colleague, Brandon Jensen. Uh, the profile and PowerPoint are, are his work, uh, and I'm happy to help out as he's on leave. Um, I'm, I'm going to provide a short summary of the presentation, and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, as many of you know, um, the Gulf of Maine is of uh, increasing interest uh, for wind development. Um, this is a complex and rich ecosystem uh, with various fisheries of significance. Uh, the least of which is, is not uh, or is not ground fish. Uh, we are particularly interested in cod and lobster. Um, in developing offshore wind, Bohm is interested in understanding the significance of uh, the parameters of these fisheries uh, spatially and temporally, uh, as well as their dynamics through time. Um, we're also interested in their social historic context. Uh, um, uh, to adequately account for them in the planning process. Um, it's thought that Fisher's environmental knowledge, FEK, uh, provides a great avenue to strengthen what we know about uh, these fisheries uh, um, uh, from landings data, uh, beacon data, and various modeling efforts. Uh, next slide, please. As, bench, as mentioned, BOEM relies on a diversity of information to understand our country's fisheries. Um, in the last 10 to 20 years, there's been a rise in interest in the use of cultural and data, cultural information on the environment um, to provide context, to enhance our understanding of hist historical conditions, to better understand trends and changes over time, um, as well as contemporary conditions and insights to what might happen in the future, not just generally, but also with regard to things like climate change. Cultural knowledge related to the environment has been codified to some extent uh, into several variants. Um, Many of you are probably familiar with the term traditional ecological knowledge or TEK. Mm -hmm. uh, another variant is local knowledge. Um, an umbrella concept, indigenous knowledge is really the, uh, as far as I know, the precursor of all this stuff. And this was discussed probably 30 to 40 years ago 
um, by anthropologists and other kindred uh, cultural uh, scientists. More recently, they've talked about FEK, um, fisheries ec ecological knowledge. Um, uh, cultural knowledge on the environment is developed over time. It's shared with a group of people. Um, it's knowledge about their surroundings, their environment, and the activities they engage. Um, to varying degrees, it identifies patterns and dynamics in, in the environment. Uh, researchers at, in the Gulf and in Boehm have realized that this information will enhance our understanding of the region's fisheries and assist our spatial planning efforts. Next, please. Okay, there are um, two main objectives. Um, one is to enhance our understanding of fishing activity. Uh, and secondly, is to heighten our understanding of the various fisheries significance to the regional social economy. Uh, the second bullet here is not really a study objective. Um, it is actually part of our approach. Um, we hope by um, partnering what we think is a trusted uh, broker, ROSA, the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance, um, we hope to improve our chances of success in collecting data and in developing a product that's both useful to us and to the communities and region at large. Uh, next, please. Uh, our methods are very general at this point. Um, we're looking to identify um, willing communities that are associated with the fisheries of interest, particularly cod and lobster. Um, uh, we're looking to conduct primary research um, uh, that is directly talking to people and collecting data. Um, some type of participatory mapping is most likely as we're looking, we're hoping for, for map or GIS data. Um, and we're hoping to use a smattering of one-on-one -on -one interviews, uh, small group discussions, focus groups. Really, we're open to what um, researchers might have to say about that. Um, uh, but we, we think those are the approaches that are probably most amenable to getting us the type of data uh, that we want. Um, we do envision that while we'll provide a general direction for the conversations and discussions, um, we really wanna hear what fishers have to say. Um, so these will be um, what's referred to as uh, semi-structured or open-ended. Um, that is, fishers will be able to focus on what fishing practices are important, what issues in space and time with fisheries um, are of relevance to us, what historical trends do they see as pertinent, uh, or any other information they want to pass on. Um, we will uh, push an ethical project using informed consent and voluntary participation, um, mainly um, uh, fully explaining to, to participants what the purpose of the data is, um, as well as um, uh, that their participation is 100% voluntary and that they can leave the project at any time for any reason they deem significant. Um, a secondary function, um, not necessarily a research method, but an approach that we'd like to uh, use um, uh, as part of this project is really a capacity building effort. Um, through outreach and ed, we want to um, heighten uh, the various communities' knowledge on the various spatial tools available, um, which we think will help them with the current um, various planning process and other activities related to offshore wind. Um, we also want to keep them abreast of the development process offshore, the schedule and status. So um, along with the research function, there is a capacity building function. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, th there were, I think he identified a number of uh, strategic questions. Um, these are just um, two of the sort of more high arching questions. One is we're hoping to get a historical perspective on the Gulf um, from fishers. And two is we're hoping to get their perspective on changes uh, in the ecology over time and the fisheries over time. Um, that's really the, the presentation. We wanted it to be short. Um, and I, I just wanted to give you a high level um, since I was pinch hitting. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions. I, I thought Mary was going to be here. So if she is getting on, she can dive in if there's something that I don't know. But um, yeah, we'd like to use this time for, for questions. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, John. Uh, we do have Mary with us now. So Mary, if you'd like to take a seat at the table. I'm here, John. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Oh, okay. Yeah, do you want to sit? There's a table with a, or a seat with a mic right here if you'd like to join us. Yeah. 
Oh, we can do questions now unless you unless you'd like to um you know provide any background on the overall so, yeah i think that's okay now. yeah absolutely you may wherever you're most comfortable um, Sorry, the metro took a lot longer to stop these ads. No one's. And uh, oh, my name is Mary Goldman. I don't have any tech research. And I'm with the Office of Renewable Energy Programs. Um, and I thought, uh, first and foremost, introduce John. And then also, when I asked him to talk to you about the Renewable Energy Program strategy. And I also thought since you know it's been 50 years they can't have the AU. Can you switch to the microphone? No, that's a good Okay. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Do I need to Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I haven't Thank seen you in a long time. So again, Mary Boatman with the Office of Renewable Energy Programs. And um, as I was saying, I'm supposed to introduce the first two studies, but um, I'm also supposed to, Rodney said, talk a little bit about the strategy of the Renewable Energy Program. And also, it is 50 years of the Environmental Studies Program. So I thought what I would do is, you know, strategy. I have difficulties with strategy. So I thought about approach being very similar to strategy and thinking about the history of what's been done with the Renewable Energy Program. I thought about um, using examples throughout the history of what our strategy has been. And so, first of all, you know, you all know that. Uh, excuse me, I just ran here from the Metro. Um, as you all know, the um, Energy Policy Act was passed in 2005, which gave Bohm responsibility for alternative energy. Obviously wind was the most commercially practical, so that's what we focused on. And as typical in the studies program, the first thing you do is you hold a workshop and you put together a, a literature synthesis. And so in 2007, we held a workshop worldwide and did a worldwide synthesis, gathering all the information of what was known at the time to form the basis of how we would plan our studies. Um, this was, of course, hosted by Beth Burkhardt. And then we went with that, um, looked at some of the key issues, and then we offered four first four studies. The first four studies, the first one focused on birds because everybody knows wind and birds is a big issue. And we funded the, something called the compendium that the USGS and Finnish and Wildlife Service was working on and gathering all the basic uh, data about birds along the Atlantic. Uh, then we also funded something we understood visuals was important. So we funded um, a study to understand all the historic properties that could be impacted along the Atlantic. And then we also heard that, oh, electromagnetic fields was important. And we funded a study on EMF. I want to point out Donna Schrader led that effort, did an excellent job, as well as Chris Farrell did the visualizations and Sally Ozell um, did the work on the birds. And then, of course, our own Rodney Cluck started the study space use conflicts because we recognize that space use conflicts would be a critical issue. Um, if you think about it, um, and the way I think about it is there's been fishing in the ocean for millennia. There's been the use of the oceans for commercial reasons for millennia. And there's been military activities for millennia. So there's a lot of stuff going on and you had to introduce this new thing into the ocean, <laughs> offshore wind. So we really needed to understand what those conflicts were. And over the years we've always engaged and we've always tried to minimize those conflicts. They will never be zero because we're brand new, we're the new kid and everybody else there has been there forever. And then uh, we moved on from there, started having our task force meetings, engaging the public, through environmental assessments, we'd hear all the issues and concerns raised by the public, and we started developing our studies based on those concerns. Um, we also continue to have workshops. Um, Jennifer organized a workshop. We had another European experience workshop because we're always wanting to learn from the Europeans. 
Um, and we started hearing their different issues and concerns in a couple of examples. Um, today, I was just at a kickoff meeting for an updated study on chemical usage. We heard from the public, what if all the turbines fall, fall over? What's the spill gonna be? What chemicals are gonna be there? So we did a synthesis and tried to understand the risk of spills from wind turbines. Uh, we understood sound. We all know sound is a big issue. Um, we heard from fishermen that, oh, the black sea bass don't like the sound. So we've done studies with sound and black sea bass, as well as uh, long fin um, uh, squid, excuse me, squid. And so we, again, addressing concerns and issues that are raised by the public. Then we also want to understand the environment that was going to be there. And I don't like the word baseline because there's really, if you think about it, no such word as baseline, it's not static. But we do want to understand some basics. We want to understand who's out there. Where are they? What are they doing? How many are there? And when are they out there? So that's basically conducting surveys over a period of time. Um, and then I also wanted to add that we like to do partnerships. We always try to partner whenever we can because we all wanna learn the same things, answer the same questions. And we've, for example, we've partnered with the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center for over 10 years, uh, conducting surveys over the Massachusetts Rhode Island wind energy area. It's the longest surveying activity in uh, ever, forever really, or at least along the Atlantic. And also we now have, I think 10 turbines in the water that have just been put in, in the past three weeks. So we're actually seeing the development and we've got a really good back of baseline history of information from which to compare and look at whether there's any alterations or changes which is really fortunate. And we did that through a partnership. Um, we've also done other types of partnerships with our other federal agencies, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. We did a diving bird study in which we use tags. So we've always been pushing using newest technology, tag technology. Um, we've done nanotag uh, studies with Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, we found out that the piping plover, which is a listed species, doesn't hop along the coast. It actually flies across the water, but it's such a tiny bird that you would never pick it up in surveys. So tagging was really the only way to get that information. So I wanted to just give you, these are just a few examples of all the different things that we've done. Um, we've also tried to understand from what I call soup to nuts. Um, we obviously collect information about what's out there, uh, we funded the development of an application for birds so that people can collect the data consistently. We funded the database that these data would feed into. We funded uh, the generation of maps of relative, relative use and abundance um, for that. And then we've also funded and promoted putting these out into the uh, data portals to make sure it's available to the public. So all the way from data collection to having that information available to the public. So not just BOEM using it, but everyone using it. And again, going back to, we're always trying to address the issues. Obviously the latest one is hydrodynamics. Uh, we started addressing that in like 2013. What does the presence of the turbines, the base of the turbines alter the flow? Fishermen were concerned that that could affect scallop larvae. So we started understanding that. We've since been expanding it and we recognize there's also the issue of the turbine spinning themselves, removing the kinetic energy, causing wakes. Does that reach the ocean surface? Does that alter it? currents as well. So we continue to answer and address the questions as they come up. Um, it's always evolving. So I can't say what we did 20, 15 years ago, probably to we'll be doing 15 years from now, it's going to be something different. And I also wanted to introduce, unfortunately, I didn't miss introducing John right away. But as an example, that study was submitted as part of a request for information last fall, because we are looking to do leasing in the Gulf of Maine. And uh, if people send in their study ideas, their information requests, what they'd like to know about. And this one was received from ROSA and another group, a, a very large group of people. It's available on the public website. And we evolved it into a study profile and we hope to partner with ROSA and others when we actually execute this particular study. And then the other study that Shane will be speaking about has to do with um, the National Science Foundation putting out their pioneer array. And again, taking advantage of what's already being done, adding something that would be of interest to us and everybody learning from it. So that's how we move through the studies program, listening to people, using the American people's dollars properly to address the issues and concerns that they have and using them effectively by partnering with whomever we can. And with that, I'd like to say that you can go to the BOEM website, drop down box on renewable energy, 
you hit studies and you can see all of our ongoing and completed studies. I think we now over have close to 100 completed studies and uh, at least 20 to 30 ongoing studies. And then I guess I'll turn it back over to John. Mary, thank you so much. That was incredible context. Really appreciate it. Was um, I in five minutes? <laughs> I, I Honestly, I was not looking, but I think probably pretty close. So thank you so much. Okay, John, back to you. Thank yes. you. We'll now mm -hmm. open it up for questions on um, that profile. So I see a couple of hands. We'll go with, to Jack first and then to Les. Yeah, hi, my question was actually for Mary, if that's okay. You, you sure. mentioned uh, collaboration with other federal agencies like NREL, for example. Can you just say a few more words about cooperation in the space you just described with DOE? DOE? Et cetera. Well, we certainly heard NREL. of NREL and the SEER project. Um, where they're collecting and disseminating information about offshore wind and we participated with them. That's one example. Um, we also do quite a bit with NREL from an engineering standpoint and outside of the studies program, but with, the, with our engineering group. So we've always liked working with NREL. Right, we, we've worked with them on a couple uh, evaluation projects. Mm -hmm. One early one was down in the Gulf um, and I'm forgetting his name, Walt, Walt Musial. Uh, and his team. And so they did an economic, socioeconomic assessment. They did a wind assessment. They did an assessment yes. of nine different uh, renewable tools. Um, more recently, we're working them up in Alaska on a similar project. Um, but we have collaborated with their water energy group, Mary, and water group on a number their of- Their water, their wind people. We've, I've done, funded some studies with them. And right now we're funding something called Project WOW with- that was under an FOA that's going out and they're going to be trying to tag whales in in August and see how they uh, interact while, during the pile driving for the Vineyard Wind Project, along with many other things they're doing. Thank you. So I'll turn next to Les and then Kelsey and then Kevin. Les, you're muted. Boy, there's probably some deep psychological significance to that. But, uh, John, this is relevant to the stuff I put in the chat to you. Um, I've I've led some FEK efforts, mostly trying to co collect information linking different NOAA programs. And what I find over and over again is that I get different stories when I'm on the boat, when I'm in a group, and when I speak to fishermen individually. And when we report back to them the result of our study, which we thought we didn't filter at all, uh, some fishermen get really annoyed and they don't like it. <laughs> so my question is, how do, we, uh, how do we extract the best info from all of this social dynamic? Are, are you asking me to, to yeah. pontificate on that? Okay, yeah, because <laughs> yeah, 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 I couldn't yeah. figure it yeah. out. Because there's other, the carries here, and, and I, I don't know mm -hmm. if we have Kevin St. Martin, but um, I mean, you know, one thing is you need to triangulate. So you want to you want to take from different sources. The other is, is that, you know, uh, cultural knowledge is, is different. Um, so um, something that I had written down for a presentation comment that I didn't give because I didn't want to go into it, um, but, but you're, you're sort of touching on it, is that uh, it's, it's often referred to as purposeful knowledge or uh, mm -hmm. you use purposeful sampling, meaning that cultural knowledge isn't spread evenly amongst a population. There are typically those who know more than others, and you can find this in any domain. Um, in fact, we've coined these terms for environmental knowledge, but they are their cultural knowledge about the environment. And we have distinguished them by traditional, local, uh, for different groups. Um, but so, so one is um, you wanna triangulate, you wanna know who you're talking to. Are they, uh, and, and typically how do you find out who, who are knowledgeable? You talk to others. Um, so people often refer to snowball, which is a sort of a way that makes us look unsystematic, but it can be done very systematically. Um, so, 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 uh, you want to talk to enough people so that you feel like you have an idea of who is in the know, who knows who knows more about a particular topic. Um, but this is also where you bring in um, really expert social scientists who are uh, who have done field work in the area 
and who know the methods um, and, and understand how cultural knowledge works. So it's not a, 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 a task where anybody can walk in there from other disciplines. Um, so, and, I, and on here right now, I would defer to Carrie, uh, maybe Rod, I don't know who else is on here, maybe Jeremy, um, I, di I didn't see Kevin. I, I think we had another sociologist on here uh, one or two meetings back, but. Thanks, John. Thank you. I'm going to turn, um, uh, John, not seeing some of the folks that you've mentioned, I'm going to turn next to Kelsey and then Kevin, Bonnie, Carrie, Rod, and then Jeremy. Wonderful. Thanks so much, John, and everyone for the presentation you uh, shared with us today. Um, I wanted to see if you could go a bit deeper in terms of the collaboration and partnerships that will help to execute the research. So namely, I'd love to hear a little bit more on how the project intends to work with uh, tribes in the region. Um, and then I have a, a subsequent question to that. I, you know, I don't, I don't want to speak to something that I haven't discussed with my colleague. Um, we, we gave some feedback and I think we were still waiting for him to digest it. Um, uh, so it, it would be, um, premature and and I'd be um, but I, there there is a sincere uh, intent to collaborate um, we see that as a way to make meaningful research and also we can't get um, you can't really get good data unless you have trust and collaboration in there with this kind of social science approach um, so um, and we are we are open to interested partners um, um, I what I said was sort of a sketch of what we're interested in doing. And, and we think ROSA is the logical one with interest, um, but we are certainly looking to others in the region. And I would um, hate to start talking about tribes just um, without, without having specifics for you. Okay. Um, well, I think then as it stands, the profile is a bit insufficient. So I'd love to have us sure. like have some type of follow up after today to COSA that um, that answers that question, because it's a major methodological question for the region. Um, ROSA doesn't have tribal um, representatives on its uh, leadership organizational chart, as I have seen it. Um, so I, I think, you know, deploying a large study of this nature in the Gulf of Maine without actually having some type of response to how tribes in the Gulf of Maine are being engaged um, is an insufficiency at this point. But like you said, it could just be that um, it needs to be flushed out more with the research team and with the fuller profile. Yeah. Um, so I'll, oh, go ahead. Let, let me say two things. One is we have extensive engagement with a number of tribes over there. I am not, that's not my bailiwick. So I don't, I don't want to speak to others. So, so that's a separate. Um, I completely agree with the project. I think the project is in an earlier stage than, than, than maybe you might be thinking. So um, we, we definitely have open ears and I'm glad to get the feedback. For sure. And I think just, you know, in terms of research ethics, at the outset, you've named ROSA. At the outset, there should be a named indigenous collaborators, tribal fishermen that are there alongside. Um, so that's sort of what I'm, I'm beckoning to. And then the other thing I didn't really see in the profile, and maybe you can expand upon it, or it's another area for us to flush out, is sort of what the DEIJ um, broader environmental justice lens of intersectionality and inclusion will look like when you're working with fishers. Um, you know, ROSA right now um, does not have any non-white fishers involved with it. So I'm just, I'm curious how we're going to get, you know, fishers who, and I think someone else asked this later on in the chat about folks who are already doing these studies in the region, people being overtaxed um, and maybe having a bit of research fatigue. But how do we get folks who, you know, are minority fishers in the region? How do we get folks who um, maybe aren't necessarily the um, holders of power in terms of uh, commercial fishing in the region, but are the folks who actually do all of the, the work, like maybe some of the, you know, immigrant populations who are working on the boats, but, you know, have some potential interests and, and need to be included. So, um yeah, sorry, that was maybe a more comment feedback, but I'll leave it there for as a sort of overall question of kind of your broader impact DEIJ approach to the research. Thank you, Kelsey. Yeah. Go ahead, John, did you wanna respond? No, just to say I duly noted and, and appreciated and um, 
yes, we, we will definitely take this back to the shop. Thank you. Kevin, Bonnie, Rod, Jeremy, and then Carrie. Hi, thanks. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, I guess my questions uh, more on the on the literature that was presented in the uh, in the pre proposal, and and it, it seems like there, you know, if, if you look at your two specific research questions. Uh, those, you know, where are the historic fishing grounds located in the Gulf of Maine, and how have these gr fishing grounds changed over decades? And there's a lot of literature on that, and there's a lot of science underway, particularly with with NOAA. There's the uh, the the stock identification group that has just uh, come out with their report. There's um, Doug Zemeska's work. You you mentioned Greg Desell's work. There's also uh, Alexander's uh, et al. in 2009 that, that date right back to the 1860s. So the, the spawning areas uh, in the fishing grounds in the Gulf of Maine uh, have been identified fairly well, but they're not really mentioned in your document documentation here at all. Is it is it that you're looking for uh, additional information onto that? Is that what you're, in which case Kelsey's point I think is you know, extremely relevant. Um, I guess I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get at what you're, you know, when someone in the comments said that, you know, there's a, a, a fatigue going on with, uh, with people being asked uh, these questions over and over again, it, it does seem to me like these questions have been, been at least answered on, on one level. I, 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 don't feel comfortable uh, answering that. I would defer to Mary. I, I, I am not Brandon. Um, I have my own thoughts, but they would be um, my own thoughts. Um, we're, we're certainly aware of the breadth of work, uh, you know, going back to Jim Mason's, Aitchinson's uh, Lobster Gangs of Maine. Um, so, um, uh, you know, I, I um, this is sort of an interdisciplinary study. So we have, um, sort of gaps on knowledge on, on both sides of our, our house that the other one's helping with. So I, I can't answer that um, uh, um, on, on my own or would, would not want to provide an answer on my own. Mary, do you have anything to say? Well, first, the profile is just a starting point, right? And then as we start evolving it and learning more, we hone it into what's needed and what's identified in the area. So we spend our time and our energy where it's best used. Um, what we really need help with, and as, as John has pointed out, is not so much understanding what fishing grounds are and such, but understanding more of the cultural nuances of, of the activity. And I think that's what we're hoping to look for, but I'm not a social scientist. So I always step my, put my foot in things as well as, um, you know, who else we need to engage. So this is just getting the idea on the table, getting your all of your input and feedback and then evolving it into something that would be incredibly useful within the Gulf of Maine. So, so cultural nuances, uh, what do you mean? Well, you can, you can put importance, oh, I go and uh, put on, a, you could do the, the participatory GIS, we've done that in other areas where you circle on the map and this is where we go fishing. We um, scanned all the books from the 1970s of the historical usage to see if, how it compared to with what we knew today and what it was moved. You can do that type of thing, but you miss the stories of the ancestors and the, the long history and the cultural significance of their fishing and everything. I think that putting it on something on the map misses so much of the dynamics, but I would leave that open to others to um, expand on. Thank you. We do still have a number of hands raised. So um, just in the, uh, for the sake of time, I'll ask folks um, that go next to just keep their remarks brief. Um, but we've got Bonnie, Rod, Jeremy, Carrie, and then Kelsey may have her hand up again. So um, Bonnie? Hi, can you all hear me? We can. Hi, Kevin. Hi, I, I know several of you on, on the board. Uh, thank you very much for the time. I'm Bonnie Brady of the Long Island Commercial Fishing Association. Hi, Mary. Um, a lot of the issues that fishermen have 
have not been really listened to from the very beginning of a lot of the issues. I know I heard Kelsey talk about having indigenous knowledge as part of ROSA. Several of the industry advisors belong to various uh, fishing associations or fishing processors. I'm not sure whether indigenous people work for them or not, but people of color definitely do. And the ability to reach out to those advisors if you have questions, I mean, I'd be more than glad to anything that you want to bring to the attention of the board, we could do that. I did want to point out, um, we've got the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance has their Fisheries Knowledge Trust. A lot of, in addition to fatigue, is the idea that where fishermen fish is somewhat proprietary. And if we say, okay, I'm going right here to do that, then 10 people may follow them. Um, I know with Marco and back again, uh, Kelsey and Mary, you probably were involved at Bowman at the time in some of those meetings. We had one stakeholder fisheries meeting in 2014 and that was it. Now, if you're talking about ecosystem-based fisheries management or marine spatial planning as to where to put these things and why, we've had virtually no input and fishermen did not have any input in Marco because we were told that as private businesses, we couldn't qualify. So it had to be only indigenous people from the three co-leads in Boehm or whichever state. Um, having a fisheries, we had the council member, one person that would sit in, but that really isn't the same as being able to push into the knowledge. The Marco site portal only has AIS for some fisheries or has specific fisheries and not all of them that exist not really any way to show in state waters. Sorry, the dog is chiming in too. And the issue is the years that were used um, did not always have a full grasp of what the fishery was. And we've had that problem since Empire One. So anyone that wants to reach out to me further, I'd be more than glad to explain a lot. The synthesis of the science that uh, Rhoda just completed a report might be a good way to go for future things that have not been addressed. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Bonnie. Rod, Jeremy, Carrie, and then maybe Kelsey. Thanks, John. This is um, interesting and I'm sh the information I think is important. I think that um, the questions identified in the profile are probably not the correct questions. Um, when I hear about historical data and I think, well, we've got a lot of historical data uh, as Kevin pointed out, then I think, well, there's a lot of work by historians that have done uh, a lot of this, this kind of analysis already. But I think that the, I think that what you're trying to get at is important. I just think that the questions need to be uh, more refined. And um, the, uh, some of the, the questions that Kelsey raised also need to be addressed. I think it's a different kind of study, perhaps, than, than what is fully represented in the, in the profile. Thanks, Rod. Jeremy? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Um, my, my question, my comment will just be brief. I'm not sure that your area isn't too large. So you, you may benefit by uh, a smaller area than the full Gulf of Maine. We would probably expect that there's going to be more offshore wind development pressure in the southern half of the, the Gulf of Maine call area. So you might think of that. But more broadly, the question is why the Gulf of Maine? Uh, we might think that there's going to be uh, more pressure uh, off the Pacific coast uh, and the issues get potentially more complex because uh, especially as you go into the Pacific Northwest, you've got uh, tribal fishing rights. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think you should think about the best area to do the study and that sort of also relates to uh the question of the you know what's the best research questions as well thank you terry thanks yeah and thanks john nice to see you again um and thank you everyone for your comments yeah i i have to say on um a couple things that have been inspired by this by my read of the profile but also by the conversation today so I think the objective stated and then the research questions stated, they don't fit with one another. And, um, and I, I think those object, the objective statements are actually probably less, uh, are, are, are important. Um, and I don't wanna say uh, 
that the research questions are unimportant, but uh, yeah, anyway, I think that the um, questions under the object as stated under the objective or the as implied by the objective are are perhaps more important. Um, the other uh, the other thing that I was thinking about just in terms of capturing people's knowledge and the connection to coastal economy or community variously defined, social and economic well-being, and so on and so forth. Um, and the discrepancies that people may find when they participate in some kind of discussion and then see the product of that discussion. I'm thinking through some of the work that we've been involved in on, on the West Coast, and I think there are a couple of insights gained that might be useful in thinking this forward. One is, and this is gory detail, but involved in a mapping project around the Channel Islands for siting of marine reserves years ago. And we mapped with individual fishermen and then we created a summary product. And we went back to fishermen and we handed each of them their own map based on what they had told us. And we explained the process whereby we went from individual's input, first we made sure we got it right, and how it was that we got to the summary product. And we asked them for input on what they felt was important about that summary product as well. And so I think you know it, it points out the importance of iterative process and helping people, making sure that you don't create a black box, um, helping people understand the steps you took to get from point A to point B and how their individual input factored in. You don't have to go to every individual to explain that, but that's that's one example uh, of, of how we did that uh, in, in that instance. <clears throat> and I guess the other thing is ca capturing what fishermen and other fishing community members see as particularly important and how things may be affected economically, socially, culturally um, by change. And let's say offshore wind energy development. Again, you know, thinking about fishermen leading or co-leading a mapping project that is less about the details of the map per se and more about the stories that accompany the map. And again, that gets down to, oh, that's messy. That's stories, that's narrative. But how do you interpret the map if you don't have the stories? And so in thinking through this kind of an approach, I think there's great value in trying to tap into this knowledge and think about how it can inform programs going forward. Um, there's a lot of work that's already been done in the region you're talking about and in some other places. There's a lot to be said about engaging from the get-go with those whose knowledge and understanding you seek to engage, collaborating with them to build something that's mutually useful. And I think that's the intent here, perhaps. Um, but getting there requires a lot of work up front to cultivate that partnership as much as it is to cultivate partnership with other scientists and so on. And working with Rosa could be a good way to do that um, in the Gulf of Maine instance. Um, but anyway, just offering far too many thoughts, but there we go. Thanks. Thank you, Carrie. Um, Kelsey, your hand is still up. Is that from earlier or is that a new comment? It's a new comment, um, but I, it won't be long. I just wanted to say that I, I think I agree with what others have said. I think um, potentially there's a bit of um, a methodological insufficiency or a need for sort of further depth in the development of the methodology. And I think that could be because this is, you know, BOA mentoring into uh, new waters, pun intended, around social science. Um, but there is a, you know, a, a whole canon of literature in this space and scientists who work in this space, um, as you were pointing to earlier, John. Um, so one I would point to is Victoria Reyes Garcia at the University Autonoma Barcelona. Um, they've done work in Spain, and then there's also work in this space out of Scotland um, that do work in, you know, in the context of uh, Fisher's local knowledge um, and the intersection of, of energy transitions and climate change and how you capture that for, um, I agree with you, Mary, an alternative term other than baseline, but being able to ensure that we have sound um, data and the best available science to make decisions moving forward. So um, just wanted to lay that as a uh, maybe guiding post for the team to go back to to try and um, bolster those methods. Thank you, Kelsey. And, and John, thank you for presenting today on, on Brendan's behalf. Um, I do want to keep us moving just for the sake of time. We're running approximately 10 minutes behind. So um, I want to turn next uh, to Shane, who will be presenting to us on ocean environmental monitoring and sound propagation study at the Mid-Atlantic Shelf Break offshore wind area. Shane, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, my name is Shane Wong. I'm an oceanographer with uh, Bone um, OEP Division of uh, Environmental Sciences. Um, I'm going to talk about the ocean environmental monitoring and sound propagation studies at the Mid Atlantic Shell Break at uh, offshore wind area. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge my uh, co authors, uh, Dr. Mary Bowman and Dr. Tom uh, Kilpatrick. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, the uh, Integrated Ocean Observing System, or IUS, um, are very effective uh, ways to conduct long-term large-scale ocean uh, environmental monitoring. However, these systems are very expensive to design, deploy, and uh, maintain and develop. Um, and uh, for this talk, I'm going to talk about the, the National Science Foundation has a, a they have this uh, ocean observing initiative and has maintains a couple of coastal ways. Uh, one of them is called the Pioneer Way, uh, and they plan and what they are planning to relocate into an area that we we think will provide us great opportunities for um, ocean monitoring to address many of Boom's um, environmental uh, assessment uh, questions. Uh, the Pioneer Way. Uh, is currently located in uh, southern New England, Shelf Break, uh, which is about 75 miles south of uh, Martha's Vineyard. Uh, the, it, it is consists of 10 uh, mowings in seven mowing, uh, seven low, uh, mowing sites, and they include uh, mowings and underwater gliders and AUVs. Um, the water depth uh, of this mowing system is like between 90 to 450 meters. Uh, it, the objective of that moorings is to study the shelf break processes and of shelf uh, and deep water uh, exchange circulations. Now, uh, the NSF is planning to relocate the mooring, uh, the Pioneer Arrays, to a uh, mid Atlantic shelf break um, of uh, the boundary um, to, uh, off the coast of uh, North Carolina and uh, Virginia, which Coincidentally, is you can see this lab, map. I'm sorry, I, I don't know what you know, that, uh, there's some overlapping ta typing, um, but uh, if you can see this map, it's going to relocate it into a, a, a off the coast of Mid Atlantic a shelf break, which is coincidentally close to of you know, two of the wind farms being developed. One is the coastal Virginia offshore wind or uh, sea valve, another the Kitty Hawk uh, offshore wind. And the uh, uh, distance from the, especially for Kitty Hawk, um, the southernmost distance of the wind farm is about 15 kilometers to the proposed uh, new relocation site, which we think is going to provide great opportunities uh, to uh, for booms to conduct uh, uh, acoustic oceanographic studies incorporating with the uh, physical oceanographic data already being collected. Uh, next slide, please. Um, to address some of the bones information needs. Um, so I have a list of you know, major areas like we need information. One is, you know, uh, as I already mentioned, you know, the uh, monitoring, long-term monitoring on large scale uh, oceanographic uh, conditions is not uh, easy. It's always very expensive. And uh, we could use this opportunity to, uh, you know, um, um, deploy acoustic sensors to conduct uh, environmental studies uh, in combination of the, uh, uh, the physical oceanographic data already collected uh, to address, uh, to look at the, uh, uh, the ocean um, variables, um, the condition change in relation to the wind farm construction and uh, operations. And also, you know, uh, as we know, uh, we have observed um, the, um, variable or uh, uh, environmental conditions have been changing and uh, due to the climate, uh, especially for one example is the uh, Atlantic uh, meridian overturning uh, circulation or AMOC. Uh, in the past decade, it, we have observed, you know, there's uh, a great uh, uh, variabilities of the, the, the AMOC uh, or Gulf Stream. And we don't know whether these, you know, uh, oh, uh, to, to address whether you know those uh, oceanographic changes is related to climate change or it's a result of the wind farm development, is difficult you know to tease these apart. So we, we hope that, you know these uh, this study could answer some of these questions. 
And uh, also there's a need to um, uh, develop updated oceanographic parameters for sound propagation um, modeling. And as, as, as you know, the sound propagation is uh, driven, uh, depend on the uh, ocean temperature and salinity and the, the density. And these uh, variables are constantly changing and to have a you know, good way to know how the sound propagation to address, uh, uh, to develop reliable models for impact assessment, we need a, a new uh, updated real-time um, data. And lastly, you know, there's a need to understand the species um, information, um, such as species presence and habitat use, uh, gained from passive acoustic monitoring that combined with physical oceanographic data to understand in a you know, ecological ecosystem context. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the objectives is the first, we have three major objectives. One is the innovative uh, ocean monitoring. Um, so there are a lot of uh, IUs, they do not have acoustic um, sensor components and mostly they are really focused on physical acoustic data sets. And we understand that uh, with acoustic um, sensors, um, incorporating with the physical and the chemical variables, uh, we can look at big, bigger pictures uh, in a larger scales using the um, acoustic inversion and see how the current stratification and mixing um, these pattern change in the long run in relation to the wind front development. And the second is the improved uh, impact prediction. As I mentioned, you know, the sound propagation varies uh, depending on the sea uh, sea temperature and salinity and the density and these are constantly very um, changing and in order to have a you know better way to predict the impacts for example you know the sound generated from pile driving associated wind from construction we need a constantly updated uh, sound velocity profiles um, and third is enhanced environment assessments um, uh, most of the passive acoustic monitoring that we know of are uh, only you know, using distributed uh, acoustic sensors that you know, gave information of the animal's presence. Um, you know, very few of them incorporating with the physical uh, oceanographic data uh, with a combination of acoustics um, data sets with, uh, and the physical oceanography data sets we can uh, look at potential changes of habitat and also uh, looking at the animals, uh, um, uh, not just to uh, get information of animal presence, uh, we can also uh, address, uh, looking at the presence and absence and looking to address the, uh, how the, the habitat use and the change of the uh, ecosystem um, from the acoustic data sets. Next, please. Uh, the methods, uh, were first, you know, deploying the acoustic sensors, co-located it with the Pioneer Array locations, and we had a uh, preliminary discussion with the NSF. Uh, maybe we could piggyback uh, on NSF's vessels to save deployment costs. Um, and second is uh, the methods is the collecting long-term time series acoustic data sets. Uh, we envision most of the data sets will be uh, collected using either more uh, acoustic sensors or bottom mounted acoustic sensors. Uh, but we also open to uh, additional acoustic data sets using gliders uh, and or uh, AUVs. Um, then of course we're going to uh, you know, uh, leverage on the physical oceanographic data to uh, address, uh, to analyze the uh, the uh, uh, oceanographic uh, processes in relation to wind farms. And we're also going to you know, uh, use the uh, bio, bioacoustic uh, data sets to analyze uh, understanding the environment effects um, from, you know, the, from, the, uh, from, from offshore wind development. Next slide, please. And we're also thinking about the deploy active sources. Uh, this is going to be a low intensity, um, largely you know, less than uh, 160 dB in reference to one micropascal. Um, that's the you know 
uh, the kind of the, the uh, behavior threshold for marine mammals and also the low frequency, less than two kilohertz uh, active sources, such as this low bell um, sound, um, uh, um, sound source uh, to look at the, um, to investigate the sound propagation in the area and also look at you know, the oceanographic um, change. And lastly, uh, the real, uh, the some of the acoustic data that's collected would be, uh, you know, broadcast the real time um, to predict, uh, forecast major oceanographic events, uh, hopefully. And also these real time uh, acoustic uh, measurements, such as from the, you know, wind from pie drivings could be used for real time mitigation and monitoring if needed. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So this is the, a list of the research questions we have uh, based mostly built around the, um, our objectives uh, to address the, uh, you know, using um, acoustic data sets to addressing uh, uh, oceanographic processes in the study area related to wind front development and also the sunspa uh, sunscape characterization and dynamics uh, in the area, uh, improved propagation modeling and uh, looking at the uh, uh, potential noise effects from construction activities, look at the signal to noise ratio, uh, for example, um, see whether the construction noise could be detected um, in various, at various moorings, um, and also uh, supplement the data for the passive acoustic monitoring um, to address animals, um, potential effects on animals. Um, that's all I have. Um, I'm, you know, happy to ask any questions. Thank you, Shane. I see some hands are already going up quickly. Um, so I will turn to Bonnie, Jack, Kelsey, and then Al. Uh, hi, thank you. I just wanted to ask of, of the presenter, what are they planning to do regarding the OOS uh, type of CODAR radar that apparently will not, the HF fre high frequency radar that will not be workable within the arrays because of issues that were initially discussed, I want to say two to three years ago when the wind turbine radar interference mitigation workshops with DOE were done. And at the time they had a working group, but they said it would take about five years if they were fully funded to actually be able from proof of concept have something that would work in place of the, I think it's 11 or 13 radar from South Jersey all the way up to perhaps Rhode Island. Thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of that. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Um, is that acoustic sensor or radar? The, the high frequency CODAR radar that's used for the ocean observatory systems, both for NOAA for oil spill modeling and also for search and rescue by the Coast Guard, they plug that in. And because of the wind turbines being in, it's a line of sight type of radar, and so they will not work. And so I'm wondering how, or if there's a solution that's part of your plan that as these sites go up, you might not be getting the information that you need. Thank you. Um, hey, 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 Shane. Hey, hey, Bonnie, it's Mary, how are you doing? Um, so as you know, or may know, we've been studying the CODAR issue. We work with CODAR and spent a lot of money to help them address it's the HF radar that does the ocean surf and surface currents. The radar stations are all along the coast. Um, it's managed by the IUS. Um, it's been important for oil spill as well as search and recovery. And we understand the presence of wind turbines will cause interference. Um, we've known about this issue for many years um, and BOEM has addressed it through working with CODAR. Um, we've uh, gotten through maybe 90% of the interference issues using software fixes um, on the interior part, but there's still some issues. Um, there's talk about potentially you could put uh, devices on the wind turbines to assist, um, and we've been talking about that. So there's lots of different solutions that are under discussion. And it doesn't really have anything to do with this particular uh, NSF array, which is primarily underwater uh, measurements. It's not above water. And this surface, the HF radar is above water. So I hope that helps address your question. 
Thank you, Mary. Will you have any of that documentation on a Bone website to take a look at? That would be great. Thanks a lot. Oh, absolutely. And Bonnie, when I get home, I'll send you an email. <laughs> thank you, Mary, and thank you, Bonnie. Jack, Kelsey, and then Al. Great. Thanks, Shane. For, uh, good description of what's going on there. I think this is exactly what BOEM ought to be doing, is making use of this other federal asset. And it was specifically designed to do just that, host other instruments and to couple it with what we know about the oceanography. Uh, I just have a couple of questions about time and space. So uh, have you looked carefully at the time you'll be able to get your instruments into the array versus when the wind farm will be built out, uh, et cetera? Can, and, and then secondly, the spatial aspect. Uh, so, you know, what are the sensors you're putting in and how are, you said a little bit about how they're different from the OOI sensors. And yeah. then my, la my last question is, is um, there, you actually said it, there's a couple of coastal arrays for the Ocean Observatories Initiative. So the West Coast is primed just as well to do this. So I encourage you to look at that. Yeah, uh, thank you. So the first question was the, uh, the, the timing. Yeah, it's good, very good question. And actually that's my question as well. We're still, still actively developing this study ideas. Uh, my understanding is uh, the NSF is starting collocating the their system in April next year, um, which is uh, you know we don't have to really match their time because uh, I already talked to the uh, pioneer we managers and also NSF uh, the IO I managers. So basically, we are, our sense is not going to fit on the array, but will be collocated um, for various engineering reasons. Um, yeah, they will be starting re uh, relocating in April, but I got a sense it could be delayed, probably would be summer. So for our studies uh, planning purposes, you know, if this one's getting funded, which we, you know, we're, we're getting news by, I guess, October, November-ish, um, we will start soliciting, um, you know, putting out the uh, RFP and uh, then we get the PIs and we'll be working with whoever with awardees and, and also work with the uh, NSF to how to look at the census. Um, the spatial um, scales, um, I think I sh there was a map on that. I, I'm not exactly sure, but by looking at, you know, the current uh, Pioneer Array of New England is nine, I my understanding is about 10 kilometers by 47 kilometers. That is, you know, they are to be about the same number of arrays, but the configuration, it, it was like nine by uh, 10 by 47. So it's kind of like elongated, but once they lo relocated to uh, the uh, mid-Atlantic uh, shelf break, uh, look at the pictures more like a, a more like a square. So I, my guess is probably more like, you know, 20, 20 by 20-ish. And uh, we are thinking about, of course, this still need to, you know, work with the awardees, the PIs, but uh, we're kind of proposing with the vertical line array, like, well, vertical acoustic arrays, if these are the moorings um, co-located with whatever sensors they have or near, very nearby. So um, I forgot what was your last question, sorry. Oh, I just was asking about the same type of study for the West Coast. Oh yeah, uh, West Coast, I understand they have endurance uh, array, right, NSF. I have not looked into that. Uh, for the Pioneer Array, it's just happened because they, they are relocating to an area where we have two wind farms. That's a great opportunity. So West Coast, we'll see, you know, if we have the, if that locations that happen to be where we need information, where, yeah, we can start talking with. I'll send you some comments about that. Thanks, Shane. Thank you. Kelsey and then Al. Yes, uh, probably two questions. The first one is, do you know why it's called the Pioneer Array? I, I bet, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed. Why it's called? Do Pioneer. you know? Oh, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's do you know? I know that. Yeah, it's because it's, uh, it's named for the Pioneer Seamount chain that it's uh, fairly close to. Of why the Pioneer Seamount chain is called that, I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah. So I think just flagging that for Boehm and for everyone on the committee, it's it's kind of a racist term to have as, and then you're going to be moving it down into a coastal area and, you know, the pioneer is moving in. Um, there's just a lot of like justice issues with that and implications. Um, so I just wanted to flag that, that if the study allows for it to be funded and for, you know, it to be potentially renamed, I think that would be uh, purpose, you know, important. I mean, using American dollars to, to move something. Um, the other uh, sort of area that I had as a question was it's potentially, I think on the map, you said it would be moving down to uh, just outside uh, Chesapeake Bay, Delmarva Peninsula. I'm not sure what the bottom disturbance, if anything, looks like for the moorings, um, but that is one of the highest concentrations of Clovis points um, in that area along the outer, that shelf area. Um, and so I just think that it, I'm curious what the, you know, at some point, and maybe it's not right now because it's a profile stage, but that there's a consultation with the tribal historic preservation officers for the area um, that the potential array will go. Okay, thank you. It's Kelsey. All right, we've got a few more hands um, and we are already past the 310 uh, time on our agenda. So I'm gonna just ask folks to keep their remarks um, fairly brief, but I do still wanna allow everybody an opportunity to speak. So Al, uh, Michael, and then Les. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks for giving me an opportunity to talk. Uh, I'll try to be quick and give the highlights. So I think this is well posed uh, and potentially the opportunity is, is, a, is real combination of acoustics with the environmental monitoring from the Pioneer Array, so that's good. In terms of the implementation, though, I have some concerns. Uh, I don't, uh, here's, so here's the issues. The Pioneer Array is in the midst of a NEPA environmental compliance process. Maybe that's going to involve a name change. We'll see. Um, that process involves the core instrumentation, not acoustic monitoring devices, right? So, any additional instrumentation requires a specific process within OOI. Uh, and furthermore, adding passive and active acoustics, I would guess, is going to require environmental review and additional rounds of approval. Uh, so with these, in, with these issues in mind, I have concerns about the timing, basically, is the bottom line. I'm not clear to me that this can be uh, managed in, in a timeline that is going to be ready to roll by April, 2024. So I think that's the gist of my concern. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, thank you all. Yeah, this is also something we are, uh, you know, we are aware of that. And uh, uh, we're working with uh, uh, National Science Foundations and to see if, you know, the imam, the compliance uh, issues, uh, basically the, I, I don't think there's much uh, environmental issues for passive acoustic monitoring. Um, so we're also in talk with the navies, and um, that's a, a separate issues. But for active acoustics, yes, I'm, I already reached out to the NOAA fisheries regarding the, the sound sources we uh, propose to uh, broadcast. And they say, you know, this 160 dB, up uh, below 160 dB should be no issues. And also the frequency we have not decided uh, not not acoustic frequency. I mean, how often we broadcast that? We have not decided. But it's if it's like an infrequent, um, that's that's okay. We 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 uh, we think we can get uh, in uh, concurrence from our fisheries. But we're we're still we'll be working on that once you know the the project moving forward. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Sean, thank you very much for your presentation today. My question is around acoustics and uh, the passive uh, recording of subaudible or infrasound in the acoustic systems. This would be in ranges below 20 hertz and uh, seems to be a, a critical range for some of the communications of the, the whales. And so establishing uh, the environmental baseline uh, for that frequency range in your survey, so that could be then followed up upon with the wind farm operations. That seems to be a gap in some of the studies that I've been reading. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. And Les, we'll give you uh, the final word. On this yeah, topic. it's a quick one, though. Um, I'm just curious if we really had our wish list, how many of these invaders, I mean, pioneers slash acoustic, arrays would we like to have ideally how how short are we selling ourselves here 
are you asking for the oceanograph uh, I, I use always or the acoustic? Yeah, the, I, the I use, well, the I say imagine an I use slash acoustic combo, but it's specifically um, I use arrays. Yeah, I, I think it's a very, very rare uh, because I think uh, uh, the, because the uh, I use arrays typically, my understanding is noisy because uh, the, the mooring is not set for listening because you have a lot of noise and to overcome that issue is engineeringly expensive. Um, so that what well, that's why most acousticians just deploy their way separately, you know. With, yeah, yeah, but in general, I the think, observational system is what's being proposed at the capacity we would really like to have in terms of the data stream coming out. Yeah, it's uh I all I can see is not that many. It's unfortunate. Okay. Yeah. We would we would like to see more, of course. Yeah. All right. We were um, scheduled to take a 15 minute break at 310 to 325. Um, I'd still like to offer folks an adequate break, so I'm not gonna ask folks to come back so so quickly. Um, but maybe it's 317 now, maybe if we could try to get started at 330, so we're about five minutes behind. Um, if that's feasible, uh, we'll take a quick break and we'll return at 330. And thank you to our guests on the line that are um, being patient with us. Okay. I'll wait for the slides to get up, but give you an overview of the Pacific region and our programs, which then ultimately guides our study priorities and our science strategy. Okay, great. You can click to the next slide. Okay, so the Pacific region, you know, just basically as areas off California, Oregon, Washington, and Hawaii, we have five planning areas on the OCS there. And until recently, we were the only BOEM region with ongoing planning or development in all three of the core program areas. I think the Gulf now has joined us in that. So we have conventional energy, renewable energy, and prospecting into marine minerals work. Uh, in fiscal year 22, we, had, we funded $6.4 million for environmental studies in the region. Uh, it was 12 studies, six new ones at 2.3 million, six ongoing at 4.1. Um, we have approximately 50 people now in our regional office and generally one subject matter expert per resource, but we're expanding that capacity. You can go to the next slide. So with conventional energy, we have 30 active oil and gas leases in the region, um, kind of a maturing program. So Production started in 1968, also happens to be when I started, um, peaked in the mid to late 90s, and now our annual production is, is a bit lower. Um, there's some figures there on the slide. Um, and then due to some other issues, um, some pipeline ruptures and some shut-in issues, we're starting to plan for decommissioning for up to eight platforms right now. So this mature oil and gas field um, is now working towards uh, decommissioning and removing platforms. And then our science strategy as a result is continued study of the marine environment near these activities, um, you know, to keep up our understanding of these impacts through time, uh, and then also collecting this information for the decommissioning activities. Okay, you can go to the next one. And I will try to move through these swiftly because I know you're all thinking the Pacific region is standing between you and cake right now. Um, so the region's big priority has really moved towards renewable energy. And I know when I started in BOEM in 2010, you know, they brought me on because we needed a bird guy because wind energy was starting to really take off or there were prospects of it coming onto the West Coast. And so probably since the last time you heard from us, we have a few updates. So we've issued a marine hydrokinetic lease to Oregon State University. And I think that's the first one in federal waters. We also just held a wind energy lease sale along the West Coast in December for five leases offshore central and Northern California. Um, and I'm trying to think if those are still provisional or if we, whether we just issued those um, and that brought in the tune of, I believe is over $700 million. Um, 
We also released some call areas off of Oregon in 2022 and have been continuing to talk with the state and, and a variety of stakeholders and other agencies over that. Um, also have the potential for wind energy offshore off Hawaii. There's two call areas on the map there. Um, those have been under consideration since 2016. Some of that may reshape and become different, but um, right now that's what we have on the map for Hawaii. And then we also received two unsolicited lease requests offshore Washington. So really busy with renewable energy, a lot of different things going on. So then with the next slide, you know, that helps define our science strategy there, which is really refining information about environmental conditions and biological communities in these areas of potential development. And then also really working on cultural resource and human use issues. Uh, you know, certainly two of the groups that we engage with most on these wind projects are tribes and the fishing community. So we also have to obtain baseline information on these cultural and human uses adjacent to these areas. Uh, next slide. And then with marine minerals, despite more than 50 years of marine minerals exploration, there's been no federal leases issued in the Pacific. Um, but however, we are considering environmental studies and resource evaluation efforts to inform potential future industry interest. Um, and currently we've been funding several uh, projects in partnership with USGS and some others. And we're also working closely with BOEM's uh, Marine Minerals Division. Um, and so we had recently two scientific research expeditions uh, off Hawaii, and then also one to the Escanaba Trough off the coast of Oregon. And so here our focus has been resource evaluation efforts in these areas that are anticipated to have the greatest resource potential. Because there's been formerly like an interest in, in sand and gravel, but now it's at kind of these rare earth minerals that may be out there on the ocean floor. So next slide. And this is just kind of a sort of a high level overview of the Pacific and our research areas and the studies. And we have over 330 studies that have been, been completed in the Pacific. And I think about three, the first 300 of those were really geared towards oil and gas based on that program out there. And, and this all started in the early seventies. But a lot of that, especially our baseline biological studies and some other things have been able to be applied to renewable energy. And now with a lot of our ongoing studies, the focus has been more towards renewable, but still with some things that are moving towards conventional energy, as well as things that cover both of the programs. Um, and with a variety of partners here on the right, uh, a lot of federal government studies with NOAA and USGS and some others, but also uh, co-ops with universities and, and then some other different groups there. And then for the last slide, and this is going to set up the, the talk that you're going to hear from Ingrid here. But, um, you know, the input in the one profile we requested input on this year is this pre-development distribution and behavior of key coastal cetacean species near Morro Bay. Um, and we really selected this study to kind of generate and explore a larger discussion with COSA on responsibilities for funder, funding and acquiring data and maybe who's most responsible for that at what scale, like when is it appropriate for BOEM versus industry? So, uh, you know, I think you've seen those questions and I didn't put them on here because Ingrid's gonna have them on her second slide. So that's gonna be kind of a segue into her talk and, and that uh, input that we were seeking from COSA. Thank you. Um, so I'm Questions for David before we turn it over? <laughs> David, you are a lucky winner. I'm sorry, but you're going to get um, a question from me. I, I live on the uh, Pacific coast of Washington. I live within one of the areas that's proposed as a wind area. It's also within the Cascadia subduction zone. You're not a geologist, but I will tell you that it is the number one uh, hazard, catastrophic hazard identified by FEMA for the United States, uh, uh, potential for a catastrophic earthquake and tsunami uh, rivaling that of to the Japan event of 2011, um, put at anywhere from 10 to 25%, depending on what part of the coastline you look at in the next 50 years. So it's a biggie. It's also was the number one seafloor hazard identified in the NOMEX study from the White House that Rodney is very well 
aware of. I was kind of astonished to see that there were no um, research proposals related to geohazard risks in the renewable energy portfolio for BOEM because three of the four identified um, uh, wind energy areas lie within the Cascadia subduction zone. Uh, only one that doesn't is Moro, where you've already taken the leases, but the Humboldt area does. By the way, the Humboldt area had an earthquake two weeks after your uh, lease sale, and there were fatalities, and, and they shut the ports down. Uh, and there's still that hazard for the areas to the north. I don't understand why Bohm has not... Bohm did do a study on uh, risk associated with uh, offshore wind development and earthquake tsunami hazards, but it was totally inadequate, did not cite any of the uh, relevant literature of the last 10 to 15 years. I don't quite understand why Bohm hasn't taken a more active stance on looking at that before offering up leases and before many millions of dollars are invested by, uh, by companies and by utilities to try to figure out whether they're going to do these projects. Um, so that's a that's an ongoing concern I have, and I just took and uh, flag that for you. Yeah, well, thanks. I appreciate that. I'll take that back and discuss that with the appropriate people. And yeah, I appreciate that. Hey, Scott, just let me say also, and you know, I think you and I have talked about this a bit. You know, through our environmental studies program, we may fund some aspects of, of geology, but there's another you know, part of, of the home with a resource evaluation group. And there's, that's where most of the, the geologists sit. Uh, and um, but it, it, it is a good question, so we can take it. Take it well, it's going to become even more important for you guys because there was something passed last year called the Disaster Resiliency Planning Act, and I think it calls on all federal agencies to coordinate their plans for major disasters. I think OMB, not once they've gotten by this budget thing we had to worry about and FEMA are going to start coming around to all agencies to talk about what, what, what you're going to do. And I think this is going to be high on their list. So I would encourage you to get ahead of the curve um, so you don't get more delays than, um, you know, you need to have. I just think it's uh, it's coming down the, down the pipe for you. I would, I would get after it. Yeah, thanks. Really appreciate that. Thank you, Scott. So our next um, presentation will be by uh, Ingrid Bidron. Uh, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, Ingrid. I apologize on the agenda that I had uh, Desiree Reeb listed, um, but this profile will be on the pre-development distribution and behavior of key coastal cetacean species near the Morro Bay wind area. So Ingrid, um, whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Great, thank you. And thank you, Dave, for that introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to COSA today. I'm Ingrid Biedrin, a marine biologist in Bohm's Pacific Regional Office. And before I begin, I want to acknowledge my colleagues, Desiree Reeb, Kathy Dunkel, and Dave Perexta, collaborators on this study and presentation. Next slide, please. Um, during this presentation, um, as Dave mentioned, I'll talk about our proposed study to collect targeted data on coastal protected species in Morro Bay, California. But I will also be using the study as an example to illustrate some broader questions that we wanted to bring up here for discussion. We want to acknowledge and thank you, the COSA members, for your early feedback. Uh, we have attempted to incorporate it throughout this presentation. As you know, BOEM's environmental studies process follows an internal review of proposed study ideas. And while going through this study's process, we received internal feedback questioning who is responsible for funding these types of studies, BOEM or the lessees. And then this feedback prompted us to consider, to consider the questions we posed here. Before jumping to the rest of the presentation, I want to give you a quick refresher of BOEM's commercial offshore wind authorization process. Offshore wind siting follows an iterative process whereby targeted data needs can be more accurately identified once wind energy areas are designated. Offshore wind regulations require that lessees provide results of biological surveys to support their site assessment plans. In addition, during and post-construction monitoring by the lessee is required through plan approvals, for example, construction and operation plans. And current guidelines encourage early engagement between BOEM and lessees to define baseline data needs. Therefore, 
We feel that discussing and clarifying some of the answers to the above questions will help BOEM to be more fully prepared for this process and these discussions. The questions we propose today uh, for discussion are listed here. Should BOEM and or industry fund these types of targeted studies to learn about potential impacts from offshore wind? Should BOEM prioritize focused regionally based or broader context based studies to learn about the potential impacts from offshore wind? And does COSA have any other recommendations for resolving these questions? Next slide, please. Now I'll give an overview of the study. I'll start by sharing our research questions up front. How do resident harbor porpoise, gray whales, killer whales, and bottlenose dolphins use Morro Bay and potential transit corridors to and from the port of Morro Bay to the wind energy lease area? Are endangered Western Pacific gray whales present in potential transit corridors of the Morro Bay wind energy lease area? And can any actions, interactions between these species be defined? Next slide, please. For some background, three wind energy leases, three wind, wind energy leases have been executed offshore in Morro Bay, California. And post-leasing survey activities are expected to begin within this next year. Impacts to marine mammals need to be evaluated and are of high concern to stakeholders. Therefore, there is a need for robust pre-development data on the habitat use of protected species. This would be a pilot-based field program focused on collecting habitat use and interaction data when the target species are known to be present in the area. Next slide, please. Morro Bay and the anticipated offshore wind vessel, vessel transit corridors are used by protected species, including gray whales, both endangered western gray whales and protected eastern gray whales, killer whales, bottlenose dolphins, and resident harbor porpoise. We need more local habitat use data for these key protected coastal species to build upon existing regional data to more accurately assess potential impacts from floating offshore wind energy activities. Next slide. A newly completed BOEM funded study supports the need for more localized data collection to support comprehensive risk assessment. As some of you might have heard of this study, uh, we call it the VIN study. And these baseline data would be used for comparison with data collected during survey, construction, and post-construction activities. These data will be vital in the implementation of management and monitoring plans in the lease area. Next slide, please. As mentioned before, the broad objectives of this study are to understand the local habitat use and interactions of four protected coastal cetacean species that occur in and around Morro Bay which are likely to interact with vessels transiting to and from the Morro Bay Wind Energy Lease area. Next slide. Um, to address this study objective, we propose a focused field program using drones, photo ID, and photogrammetry to clarify habitat use, individual patterns of residency, and interspecies interactions. Passive acoustic monitoring will be used to complement and expand the photogrammetry data to inform for movement patterns. Existing passive acoustics data will be integrated to further inform these outcomes. Field work will be appropriately permitted and will involve cost-effective shore-based small boat operations to collect the data for one month per year over the course of three years. Field work will likely occur in the spring when the species of interest are expected to be in the study area. Thank you. And at this point, uh, I would invite any questions or feedback that you have. Thank you, Ingrid. I'll take a moment to look for um, any hands. And I see uh, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for that. I'm curious why you decided to do coastal species when the actual wind farms can be far offshore where most of these species don't exist. I've got a bunch of questions, but that's the first one. <laughs> Well, we do have another uh, proposed study profile that looks more at the broader scale um, use habitat use of these species. But this particularly per particular study, um, for this study, we wanted to look at those transit corridors because we think that something that's really important is these areas where the vessels are going to be going to and from the lease areas. And um, there are some important um, species there. There's the, there's a resident harbor porpoise population, and then some of these other endangered and, and highly protected species. So it's a good question. We do have other studies looking at those things too, but this one was focused on those uh, resident and, and local areas. 
So uh, another question is, if you see, uh, how will finding, how will identifying uh, Western Pacific, Western gray whales, if you have that information, how will that change anything? What will you do with that? And I, I say that because we already know that they're going, they've been identified in the Lucubrian gloom. So we know that some proportion of the population is making its way up and down the West Coast of the U.S. So I don't see how photo ID, especially during a one month period of time, you're not going to really, the probability of seeing a Western gray whale, since there are very few of them, we already know they're there. So how would that change anything? What would you do with that information? Well, I, the, so this study is, um, we're trying to focus on, like you say, it's a very specific time of year. We tried to, we chose that one month because it's when we've identified that the most, you know, there will be the most, like the highest presence of those those animals that we've highlighted and especially of um, some of the, some of those migratory species. And so we, the, like, this is going back to the broader questions. We're trying to understand more about the, you know, we're looking at the big picture, but we want to, now that we know where that wind energy lease area is, we want to look more at the local data. And so this is part of that baseline information we want to get. And we're trying to get more fine-tuned information so that we can know moving forward if we need to, um, you know, fill certain data gaps um, or if, you know, that can inform the type of, types of mitigation activities that are required under, you know, for the, the lessees. So this is not supposed to be a one, this one study isn't supposed to be the end all be all. This is just help to help us fill some data gaps and get more information for what we want to do moving forward. Okay, but what about, I mean, there's other marine mammal species and if there are going to be other studies, there's a whole variety of pinnipeds, there's a sea otter. What about the other species that you're, you haven't addressed in this well, study? Well, I mean, yeah, again, this, this is, you know, we're trying to look at, this is one piece of a much broader research program and, you know, in terms of trying to keep the budget reasonable and looking at the, you know, the tools available to us. This, this is only going to be one piece of, you know, broader research activity. So we acknowledge there are other protected species there. Um, but for the, the field work, you know, the tools and the methodologies that are proposed here, we, we wanted to target on these, target these migratory corridors. And again, like it's only one piece of a much larger. Yeah, I guess if, if we're, if we're assessing this, it's, if you get you know, it's called, you know, piecemealing. If you don't have the larger picture, it's harder to put this in context of, of what else you might do. So that's why I asked the question is, is getting this little piece without knowing what else is being done is, is hard to, to say this is the best piece or this is comparable to other pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so yeah, that's helpful feedback. I'll leave it at that. That was probably more... No, Dan, thanks so much for the question. And Ingrid, if you don't mind, I'm going to jump in. Yeah, Hi, yes. everybody. Desiree Rebin, uh, sort of a co-author on the profile. Um, Dan, I know that some of the, the members have actually um, had an opportunity to take a look at the, the vulnerability impact analysis, which is the, the VIM study that Ingrid mm -hmm. mentioned. Um, and one of the motivations of this profile is not only to sort of ask those bigger questions of, you know, when should BOEM be doing these types of studies, if BOEM should be doing them at all, talking about the regional sort of very localized scale. Um, part of the outcomes of that VIMS report indicate that in order to do a really comprehensive risk analysis, we have to have better understanding of what these regional animals or localized animal groups are actually doing when we're thinking about impacts from offshore wind. So the VIMS study looked at huge the whole California coastline, including Oregon, Washington, and, you know, divided things appropriately, but then we need to have finer resolution when we're trying to answer these more specific questions. So that's why, you know, this, this study is part of a much larger program. Obviously, we've got many other studies and we, we actually are pursuing um, another profile on sea, sea otters, which is not presented to the national academies. Um, so we're certainly not proposing that these are the only species of interest. We're basically just saying, because we've identified that Morrow Bay is now an existing lease area, and we know that we have data gaps for some of these species, and it's going to be intersecting some of these activities, how best do we actually fill those data gaps? I hope that helps. 
you, Desiree, for joining us as well for that. Um, next, I'll turn to Mike and then Carrie, Jack, and Lee. Hi, Ingrid. It's good to see you. Uh, Mike Conroy from Responsible Offshore Development Alliance. I kind of want to piggyback on what Dan was asking about, you know, given uh, there's two ESA listed species in particular that I'm thinking of, humpback whales and blue whales that transit through those areas. Um, and further given that a lot of the, uh, the, it is envisioned that the shipping traffic that will get the turbines to and from those locations will generate from LA Long Beach or San Francisco or points north. Are, are there plans to expand the scope of this study uh, to look at those two species in particular, given those two species ability to have dramatic impacts upon the West Coast crab fishery? Um, thank you, Mike. I mean, I would say in a similar answer to the previous question, that this study is very focused on this area, but it's meant to help us understand that area. And then we do have, like we have ongoing other studies to look at those larger scale areas and also those, those you know, to encapsulate all the species of concern. So short answer, yes, but not specifically with, the study is not designed specifically to, to target those larger areas. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Jack? Yeah, thanks for that. So uh, two questions. One is, are you planning to collect environmental data, for example, temperature at a minimum, because we know the El Nino is coming and there's going to be lots of interannual variability. And then second to Mike's point and Dan's about the uh, larger context, it seems like the mobile platforms is the ideal way to do that. You could actually run them from near the port itself out to the study area and back. So beyond just the, the fixed platforms. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I mean, to answer that second question first, um, so we didn't drill down like totally into the specifics of the methodology here because it is going to be up to the person who gets this contract to the, to the so we will be overseeing that, but we don't know the exact specifics yet. So um, also, again, I know this kind of sounds like a broken record and does feel free to jump in, but we do have other studies that um, are looking at capturing some of these more like these oceanographic using using technology and, and tools that are going to try to capture this the oceanographic variables um and looking at some of those other tools as well so again I think this is a very focused study this one that we proposed today but um the other study profile and other work that's going on is is looking at these bigger bigger questions but does feel free to jump in if you want to add anything thanks Ingrid yeah, just to reiterate what Ingrid said, you know, we've got currently we have the adrift study, which is using um, floating uh, acoustic buoys, and they're they're sort of drifting all the way from a pilot uh, process in Oregon all the way in sort of around the California lease areas, and you know, pretty much covering the California coastal ecosystem. So that's one of the ongoing passive acoustic studies that we're doing. In addition, um, we're supporting the, the PACMAP study, which is very regional scale, looking at multiple species and partnership with NOAA. And um, a study that's about to be completed and that maybe Dave Perexta could speak to if anybody's interested is, you know, we've been running aerial surveys uh, that also look at avian and marine mammal and, and other marine species um, that, like I say, is re it's going to be completed soon. So, you know, again, this is this is one study that we're looking at really to sort of to hone in on understanding how we deal with these very localized areas of impact. Um, we've got a very keen eye on the, you know, broad scale regional, um, you know, coastwide uh, data collection. But when it comes down to these smaller questions of this focal have you know like resident habitat for harbor porpoise for these um you know potential mixing of eastern and, and western gray whales um you know and to answer dan's earlier question what would we do as ingrid said part of the vim study also indicated that there's a potential high need for concern for animals that are not often seen in the area but because of their status they should require additional mitigation action and so that is part of asking this question in that if we do indeed in this pilot study that may inform additional work need to take a, a deeper look as to how many western gray whales are there 
that could have a, a significant you know, uh, influence on informing how we would provide mitigation um, approaches to our decision makers. So again, guys, this is just a small part of a much larger research program. Mm -hmm. We're not, you know, we're not limited to just the study. The Pacific region is conducting many, many marine mammal focused studies. So um, it, it really is about, you know, trying to understand how much responsibility we have for collecting this more localized information. And if the academies is sort of suggesting that actually we should be not focusing on collecting this more localized information and we should keep our focus on these more large scale studies, that's a valid comment, but that's actually, you know, what we're asking to hear. If I may, just a quick follow up. That's excellent contextual information. I'd just like to encourage Baum to show us that some way, an integrated diagram or something visual that lets us know that all that's going on simultaneously. So thank you. Yes, thank you, Ingrid and Desiree. And I'm, um, I see we've got Lee and Carrie um, in the queue as well. I just wanna take a moment um, to just quickly remind folks that um, none of the input that we are providing in uh, COSA meetings is on behalf of the National Academies. Um, we do not reach consensus uh, as a standing committee. So it is the individual input of the members and our guests, um, just like to reiterate that point, but I don't wanna take any more time with that. So I will turn it next to uh, Lee and then to Carrie. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for all of that. So I actually, my questions are about your specific methodologies that you've proposed to try to get at these localized residency and habitat use patterns. I'm not quite following how using drone photogrammetry is going to help you do that, I guess, if, like linking habitat use and individual residency. You've mentioned mark recapture stuff. So maybe you could provide a little bit more feedback on that because I don't see how those two align. And also, and then you suggest using passive acoustic monitoring to look at movement patterns. So unless, you know, you, I don't, that's not really gonna work very well at an individual level, like individual movements, and you'd need like sort of a larger array to look at movement patterns. So yeah, I guess I, to get to your specific localized fine scale questions that you're proposing, I think, yeah, do you have any comments about how you expect those methodologies to align? Um, sure, I can I can take a stab at those. So first of all, I think part of this is just definition, what we mean by localized and fine scale. I mean, we're not talking about charting like paths like of individual animals. We're talking more about still like how they're using that, the bay or the area, you know, what animals are there or not there. So we're not trying to track, I guess, is what I'm saying in terms of fine scale arrays. Um, again, I mean, we didn't, we provided some of the possible tools and the things that we wanted to address. Um, so, I mean, photo ID, like mark recapture, some of those are the, the types of things we're trying to look at. We're going to use um, the fluke book for the gray, the gray well catalog um, based on photo ID. So, yeah, we, this was something that in, even in some internal discussion, we, we didn't want to get too into the specifics and the nitty gritty because these things could, the specifics could change of, of the the methodology. So that's my general answer. Des, did you want to jump in at anything else? Okay. So yeah, we're just, we're, we really didn't want to get into the details because that part of it could change. Okay. Well then, I mean, I, I would suggest not you know, make, well, I don't know. Just the, the pho photogrammetry is measuring, you know, how long and big and whatever measurements of animals. So that doesn't really fit with the context of what you're proposing. Um, and, you know, and unless you're using drones that can do surveys, you know, to, to look at distribution of animals, and that's a whole nother technology and methodology. You know, for me, when, when you say you want to do residency patterns and, and habitat use, that's doing surveys, traditional marine mammal sort of surveys, and photo ID, you know, from a boat to, to then look at, you know, matching of animals and individuals to look at residency, which I do think are important issues at that localized scale but I just didn't follow how drones would help with that aspect. Okay, yeah, and this does include small boat, as we mentioned, small boat operations and those traditional photo ID type surveys and that sort of thing. But okay, thank you, that's helpful feedback. And, and Lee, sorry, I will jump in, Ingrid, now. Um, but thanks, it's nice to see you. I think, um, you know, the, the photogrammetry is another sort of added capability um, for, you know, just 
sort of understanding maybe I don't know and this is taking a little bit of a, a, a sort of a swing as Ingrid said we haven't finalized everything because this is really just why we wanted to come to the COSA and and I mean and, and to all of you guys to to get your opinion in that you know the photogrammetry would not only be for you know the harbor porpoise where we would be hoping to expand that to you know the humpbacks and blue whales potentially and um the killer whales certainly and gray whales so um you know there's there's multiple aspects of the types of data that we can collect but the the photo id for sure is is sort of the mark recapture element and that would be focused on hover porpoise and so we, we're basically just throwing the toolbox in there to say hey we've got multiple species with different behaviors and we're trying to understand what could be happening here so you know if you if you've got more sort of directed um advice onto how we could more appropriately use better tools that is most welcome yeah sounds good yeah I, I guess if you put together an rfp i might you know focus more on the questions so that the tools follow the questions instead of the other way around but um yeah so thank you for that feedback that was good harry did you still have a question this may be um, an unnecessarily picky point but i'll make it quickly and offer it with good intent um this is framed as the transit areas to and from the port of Morro Bay. The point has already been made that more likely than not, things will be coming and going in terms of construction, at least, and deployment through LA Long Beach or possibly the San Francisco Bay Area. And that the Morro Bay Area would be perhaps a launch point for smaller maintenance operations. I don't know. Um, but I guess just in sort of thinking about okay if you were to put an rfp out or whatever i would i would encourage you to frame it with that caveat very clear because there will be community members who see that and um that's it's it could be misunderstood or it could be misleading so make it really clear and maybe if it if the idea is to pilot it also because this is something that would be tractable and this this localized transit is potentially quite relevant so the understanding the patterns there, um, then um, speak to some extent at some point somewhere along the way to how you would account for that larger transit, that longer transit uh, pattern and, and the potential for interactions there. Anyway, thank you. Um, this is really interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Um, I'm gonna turn Scott to you. Next. It's really a quick question. Did, did we get a question from Susan? Yes, so that is okay. my. That's, that, I, I that, to play, that's what I want. Yep, we have. Um, so Susan Parks, who is a committee member uh, of COSA, she um, was trying to stay on the line as long as possible today, um, but had some conflicts with this particular time. I, I do think most of her questions have been uh, anticipated by others, um, but I'm going to go ahead and just read them verbatim so that I don't misconstrue anything. Uh, the first was what pre-existing baseline siting data, if any, is available for this region. And the second um, question that she had was uh, why the selection of these specific species rather than all marine mammal species in the area, primarily asking about exclusion of other recognizable baleen whales, such as humpbacks that are present there. And then in response to the questions posed on the slides, uh, she says, my response question would be whether BOEM could require pre-construction surveys from industry and or partner with NOAA for interagency surveys for data collection to supplement BOEM funding for these baseline data. So um, I know she would have shared those on her own had she been available to do so. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And would love to, yeah, maybe we can get a written copy of those eventually too. So thank you for sharing those. All right, I think that wraps up our profiles uh, for today. And so, oh, David, well, go ahead. Yeah. One thing before we do go, do and I know like, again, like we're, this is the second time you're we gonna be accused of getting in the way of cake, but <laughs> do, do we wanna discuss this issue or maybe over cake about the appropriateness of what level, say government fund studies versus when it's appropriate for industry to do it? If I mean, folks would like to have that conversation, I guess I'll defer to Rodney. We'll be eating into his time a little bit, um, but I'm happy to open the room to additional discussion. And I will defer to the committee. 
if the committee would like to discuss this, it, 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 it is important. Um, and, uh, and, you know, to, to me, as we move forward with all these activities on, on the OCS and all the, the science needs, it really does have to be kind of all hands on deck. The developers need to be part of the solution. And that means be part of the science funding, you know, with the federal government. Uh, in many cases, we're looking towards opportunities to where we can pull that funding together and, and you know, work together to, to solve these problems. But in other aspects, there may be stipulations on the lease that's a, that the developers need to go out and collect certain data, you know, part of their stipulations. So it is, uh, you know, it is an important question uh, in, in, in moving forward. Uh, and, you know, I think, I think how we deal with it and kind of the... Uh, it was going to be very important, and it's going to be really important for the developers to to have clear uh, an understanding and what the expectations are and, and moving forward because you know they're a business; they got a plan, they got to make money, All right? So it's, we're going to have to work together on this. So, you know, perspectives on the committee on this uh, over, over now or over cake or whenever are are welcome or just in the future. Thank you. Well, you do have some hands raised, so we'll go oh, ahead and run okay. through those, and then. Uh... And then we can move along. So we'll turn to Scott, Rod, Kevin, and then Carrie. So uh, I have a, I, I'll have. start with a question. Am I correct that, that this is the first such study of this kind undertaken by Boehm in support of a wind, uh, wind offshore wind development in the US? Have you done anything like this in the Atlantic, for example? Or is this the first time you've uh, tried this. If, if you did do anything in the Atlantic, what were the key lessons that are learned that are relevant to this discussion that you want to have here and the question you posed? Yeah. Oh, well, I can jump in and try to answer that. Um, we, we did do some, um, some researching and reached out to our, our colleagues on the, in the Atlantic and kind of depends, how you, depends on how you want to define the study, but it really was the first, this is the first of, if we're looking at Protected species okay. is the first of this kind of this focus type okay. of study. Okay. Okay. Then, then you've answered that question. So then I will go on and give my, my comment then. Uh, you, you, the region asked if this study should, and I already shared this with you, Rodney and Jessica. So maybe it went to the Pacific region. I don't know, but Pacific region asked if this study should be funded by industry, which I assume means the leaseholder in this case. Uh, if such funding was not a stipulation of the leases, then no, not in this case. I would not, I would not retroactively, I don't think you can do that. My sense is that Bohm should take the lead role in establishing the template for such baseline studies described here. And so should fund this first ever study. If this is the first of this level of detail, then I think you guys need to do that. I see a logic for the leaseholder to fund follow-up studies on the lease to monitor impacts over a project life, over the project life style, cycle. Um, but only if it was included in the stipulations of the lease. So you'll have to change change things going forward. I, I can see Merritt and Boehm taking the lead for the baseline studies for all leases uh, in a particular region to ensure consistent quality of that critical baseline data. Attention will be needed to ensure independent peer-reviewed assurance of scientific integrity of any such work to ensure that the, at the end of the day, it can withstand legal challenge because that's kind of what's driving this. Is it not you want to make sure that we do not go in violation of the Endangered Species Act or Marine Mammals Protection Act. We're trying to, uh, you know, safeguard, you know, the, your role of, as environmental stewards, right? So um, I think you're, you got skin in the game, and, you know, for now, and, and, and uh, but I think there's a pathway to, you know, get others to fund it down the road, but you gotta be upfront with them right up front. That's my, that's my two bits. Thank you. Rod? Kevin, Kerry, and Rona. Well, I couldn't agree with my co-chair more, um, but it was, um, it wasn't my, that's, I thought that was brilliant. Um, so I think that, uh, I think that this is important. It's not in my area of expertise. I think that you need to go back to decision-making and requirements for leases. If you see how this is used in decision-making, and how this will impact what you require of leases, um, then you don't need to know the whole picture. You need to know how it's going to impact decision making for for Boehm and for leases going forward. And if that's if you see the way that that is going to be used, then I think that this is something that you should be talking about and moving forward with. 
So, so I, I would say, um, you know, these, these, uh, th this is something we've kind of grappled with uh, on the East Coast too, because you have the impact of a particular development site, which, uh, you know, there's an, there's NEPA requirements, there's, there's getting the license for the, uh, uh, for those studies through the EPA. And, and, and so a, a part of that burden has to be carried by the developer, just in, in order to, to, to meet the requirements. But then with these migratory animals, you have uh, you have a regional component, and right now we don't seem to have a really good mechanism of pulling together the whole regional component. On, on the East Coast, it's it's even more complicated, where you have several companies having different lease areas up and down the coast and stuff. So there has to be some kind yeah. of over oversight of that, and uh, and and I think that Boehm can can take a lead in in that. That, that would be my, my thought. Okay, Rona and then Jeremy. Um, so I, I agree with everything that's been said so far. My concern is not simply that the study should withstand legal challenges, um, but that there should be no perception of a conflict of interest. And so um, my worry uh, with developer funded studies would be that it would be almost impossible to keep them staying free in that respect. Um, so if there were a way that the money was um, put into some trust account and administered by Bohm, uh, that seems to me to be a much safer way to do it. And just to respond to that, when, when I was talking about pooling funds, that's an opportunity that we're exploring that perhaps if we were to work together with the developer, that money could be channeled through the environment and going out. It's uh, something we're still working and talking about. So I'm just talking about it conceptually now. Thanks, Rodney. It'll be interesting to follow that development should it come to fruition. Jeremy, I think you are next. Uh, I, I would say it's wholly appropriate for Bohm to take the lead on these. You ultimately are the one that has the NEPA responsibility, not the developer. You're the one that has to make the assurance of no jeopardy, um, not the developer. Um, and uh, you're the one that we as, as citizens and residents of the United States look to to protect all of our interests, not just our energy, development interests, but our uh, natural resource interests. So um, yeah, I, I, I have no problem with you undertaking this this work. And I think particularly if this is new and, and, and somewhat novel, then um, let's do it and let's do it right. Uh, and let's get a good template out there. Um, yeah, agreed with all that. And um, also outside my area of expertise by a long shot, but something that I've heard in conversations with some folks who are who do work within that area is a concern that when data are collected and maintained by developers, for example, it's very hard for the rest of the scientific community and the broader public to be able to um, gain access to and use those data, which could be used actually for a whole range of purposes. And so I think by taking some direct responsibility for data collection, production, et cetera, overseeing that process, not only do you help ensure continuity and quality, but you also ensure accessibility of that information. And I think that's actually super important. So thank you for the opportunity to comment. Excellent. Seeing no additional hands in the room or online. There I think 19 comments on the chat. Yes. <laughs> There's been an extremely active chat yes. today throughout the whole um, program. So uh, we will absolutely be capturing that as uh, Academy staff. But I um, want to open this uh, to Rodney to kick off our celebration of the studies Pro study program's 50th anniversary. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I've got about 63 slides to go through, so just bear with me as, no, I'm just kidding. 
uh, I just I just got a few just to set the context. Uh, and also our graphics designer is so wonderful with looking at this background here. It's amazing. So yeah, 50 years of ocean science. Um, you know, in in 1973, I, I, I you know I often say you know, in, in looking back, you know, when Congress after, actually did the uh, Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act and actually created the Environmental Studies Program, that they got it right. I think it's I think it's good to have a small program that can actually reach out to other to the private sector to uh, academics and others to pull in research, um, and and over this time, I mean, it is it, it's challenging. I mean, all the things we've talked about today, looking at uh, the, you know the impacts on the human, marine, and coastal environments. Wow. You know, I mean, that's just such a handful. Uh, that's why we have the experts we do, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's really a lot. Next. Um, you know, 76 looks like a really good year for the environmental studies program. Uh, we're going to get back there. Uh, we're a little higher in 23 than we were in 22. That's mainly because of my IRA funding. Come in. Um, but uh, we've been you know, kind of up and down over, over the years. And, and you know, my, my hope is that as, as we continue for the next 50 years, which we will, uh, that our budget, our science budget, really kind of becomes uh, commensurate with all the activities that we, uh, we oversee. So for years, it was just oil and gas. And as you know, we've talked about there's so many more things uh, now that we're in charge of. Next. So I think you got to hit it again. But when you think about, you're just talking to people, what do you think about when they, they talk about the environmental studies program, nimble, flexible, proactive? These are some of the things that, that, that come to mind, which uh, you know, makes me uh, very pleased to be part of a, an, an amazing program like we have. Next. But what makes it amazing is really the people. So again, we don't have the uh, aircraft, the ships, uh, the satellites, but we got some amazing people and dedicated scientists. Uh, and if you look at some of the outfits, you know, some of them were from the 70s there or the 80s, and uh, some of them a little more modern. But, uh, you know, you can see some familiar faces in there over the, you know, the, the entire time we've, we've existed. And I think it's just, uh, you know, really been pretty amazing. So, next. So I really think our leg legacy is really not only to produce uh, the use inspired science, but also use inspired scientists. Is that over the last 50 years, uh, there's been a lot of scientists created through our funding. A lot of people got their PhDs, masters, a lot of people went on to fantastic careers. And I think that's really an, an important part uh, of our, our legacy and something to be proud of. So with that, we're going to go eat cake, I think. So thank you. I think we have the cake just outside the room that folks are um, welcome to. And I'll just note for the COSA members, we do have a scheduled dinner tonight. Um, Eric, maybe you can give us some input on when and where the reservations are. 6.30 p.m. Cabin Conference. It's about a five minute walk from the hotel. Excellent, all right. <laughs> Well, let's eat cake. A lot of these. You've been through a lot of these. And this was an exceptionally uh, productive meeting today. Uh, I really and uh, really want to shout out to the Bone folks for a great job, folks, presenting your stuff. Uh, we had cogent, concise presentations, left room for a lot of discussion. Um, Really want to thank our guests, our special guests from so, so many of them calling in some at odd hours. Really appreciate that. Um, and I want to thank our staff for pulling this all together. So uh, uh, I think, Rodney, I don't know how you feel, but I thought this was a pretty particularly productive uh, day once. That was fantastic. Very good. So thank you all very much. <laughs>